Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Planning Commission hearing for Thursday, July 8th, 2010. I would like to suggest that we start on a item on which we can all agree, and that's the respect and love of our country. If you are able, please rise and join me in saluting the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Kathy, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Denayo? Here. Mr. Sevison? Here. Mr. Gray? Here. Mr. Moss? Here. Mr. Crabb? Here. Mr. Johnson? Here. Mr. Brentnall? Here. We have a full house. Next item on the agenda is the report from the planning director. Michael? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of items to bring to the attention of your commission. Uh, on the July 13th Board of Supervisors hearing, they will be considering an appeal of the Quarry Ponds additional signing that was denied by your commission previously. Uh, after that action, we'll be sure to report back to you uh, how the uh, board uh, took action on that. At your July 27th meeting, pretty full agenda set. We have the Rancho Del Oro residential subdivision in Granite Bay. We have a conditional use permit for a temporary batch plant up in Nyack. This is for the I-80 improvements that are ongoing. Uh, consideration of a draft EIR for the Dry Creek Community Plan transportation element in a series of zoning text amendments, one for surface mining reclamation, uh, one for the creation of an administrative citation process, and then one for the fowl and poultry issues that you previously heard uh, this, uh, previously heard this summer. Mm -hmm. On August 10th at the board, there are three appeals that are being considered. The Bunch Creek Rezone will be going back to the board for consideration. The Miner's Ridge uh, apartment complex located over in Bowman will be going on appeal. And the Celebration Church appeal, uh, which your commission supported, uh, we will uh, update you on those once the action is taken by the board. And that concludes staff's comments. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the planning director? I guess not. At this point, is there anybody in the public who would like to address the commission on things that are not on today's agenda? Bohemia Project will bring that up, and you'll all be in, given an opportunity to speak about that. But uh, is there somebody who wants to speak on something not on the agenda? Seeing nobody coming forward. And it's uh, 10.03. We'll call the Tahoe City Industrial Park Garage Second Story Edition matter. Michael? Mr. Chair, this item was previously considered by your commission at the June 24th hearing. After receiving public testimony, it was the conclusion of the commission that this was an appropriate project to support, and you directed staff to prepare findings and conditions of approval for the project. Staff has prepared those findings and conditions, and they are in your packet. The applicant has reviewed uh, the recommended conditions and is in support of all of the conditions. Staff supports the project as uh, presented. Okay. My recollection is that we advised the applicant that he did not have to attend this meeting. Uh, is the applicant here? Seeing none, then we'll assume that he's not here. Is there anybody from the public who wants to address this matter? Seeing none, we'll cut off public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion or motion. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, as I wasn't present at the June 24th meeting, uh, I will be abstaining from voting on this. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Any comment? Motion? Well, I'll make a motion that um, we we've already basically approved it but that we accept um, the findings and attack um, conditions and approve um, the CEQA findings and as, as attached you want to adopt the CEQA findings and yes. uh, conditions in the staff report uh -huh. okay Is there a second? Second that. any discussion I'm going to abstain as well Larry Sevenson is going to abstain. Okay, for those of us left standing, uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, none. Okay, carries. All right. Next item is the conditional use permit.
for the Bohemia Retail Project, an off-signed signed final environmental impact report. Uh, Jerry Haas. Morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, the project before you uh, has been before your commission on February 25th when you took public comments on the draft EIR. The request before you today is to allow for a, uh, the construction and operation of a 155,000 square foot retail building on an 18 acre parcel here in North Auburn. The project will also include an accessory fueling station with uh, nine pumps and a total, or nine dispensers and a total of 18 pumps and also request for an off-site sign. Uh, the request entitlements would be a conditional use permit for the primary use, a minor use permit for the off-site sign, which would be along Highway 49, just north of the Hulbert Way intersection, and it would direct traffic from 49 up to the project site, and also a certification of the final EIR for the project. This is an aerial view of the property. It's located uh, on the east side of State Route 49. It's just south of the uh, Union, Union Pacific Railroad tracks and north of Luther Road. The project is zoned commercial plan development. This slide's not too clear, but there it is. It's a zone district that runs up and down Highway 49. It forms a rather extensive commercial corridor that extends from the uh, uh, north limits of the city of Auburn and all the way up through Bell Road. The site abuts single-family residential zoning to the north and to the east, uh, and also abuts industrial and commercial zoning to the south and to the west. This is a historic aerial photo of the former uh, Cal Ida Lumber Mill. The, uh, the Cal Ida Lumber Mill was purchased uh, and became the, the Bohemia Lumber Company in 1978. It operated until about 1984. Uh, when the buildings and structures were removed that followed a fire out there. The site has been vacant since that time. A few requests for development have been proposed since that time. Uh, notably, a similar proposal for a Walmart was approved by the Board of Supervisors, uh, but was later withdrawn by the applicant. Uh, most recently, the Planning Commission approved a 114-lot residential subdivision on the site, uh, but the applicant withdrew the application prior to completion of the rezoning uh, due to the housing market crash of 2007. <clears throat> These are some current photos of the site, which contains a mix of native and non-native grasses, shrubs, and trees. Uh, as you can see in these photos, uh, the site retains evidence of the former use of the site as a lumber, uh, lumber mill. Amidst the grassland, there are remnant building slabs, paved areas, and, and roads. The, uh, I think we... The primary access to the site is proposed at Holbert Way and State Route 49. This is where the entrance to the site would occur on a bridge that goes over Wise Canal. There is a uh, secondary emergency access that would allow for pedestrian and bicycle traffic at Canal Street. The improvements required are uh, typical. So actually, here's a, a view. There's the Canal Street entrance, and then um, down here is where Holbert Way would come into the project site. Improvements are typical of those required for new commercial projects in the county, including utilities, paving, parking, and landscaping. Uh, the project would require off-site improvements to sewer facilities and to area roadways. The applicant would also be required to pay a fair share into several capital improvement programs, um, and that would allow for future roadway improvements. At this point, as uh, stated down here, a tenant is not identified. However, the end user could be a discount club store, a discount superstore, or a home improvement center, and potentially even just a general retailer. This is the proposed site plan. The building would occupy the northeastern portion of the site. The fueling station is shown at the southwestern portion of the site, and the remainder of the property is uh, occupied by the, uh, by the parking fields and then the perimeter landscaping all the way around it. You ha all have a copy of the staff report which summarizes the anticipated environmental impacts and analyzes mitigation measures for those impacts. Attached to the staff report are dozens of comments uh, that we have received additionally since the close of the public comment period on the draft EIR. Staff has reviewed all those comments and has determined that they do not raise any issues that have not already been identified in the EIR. There were three alternatives uh, to the proposed project that were analyzed in the draft EIR, a no project alternative, a no canal street access alternative, and also a mixed use alternative. While the mixed use alternative was found to be environmentally superior alternative, 
it fails to reduce the traffic and air quality and cumulative air quality impacts to less than significant levels. Uh, therefore, CEQA does not require the adoption of this alternative. It's important to note that the same significant non-avoidable impacts, those to traffic and to cumulative air quality, would have uh, existed with the pro proposed project as well as with all three alternatives. Uh, in fact, these impacts would have existed even if the previously approved Bohemia residential subdivision was uh, constructed on the site. As stated in the staff report, the remainder of the potential environmental impacts such as noise, aesthetics, biological, cultural, land use, and socioeconomics are all reduced to less than significant levels, levels with the mitigation measures proposed in the EIR, and they're all required as conditions of approval for the project. Staff has received several comments that, that suggest a recirculation of the EIR is required due to the additional discussion of the no canal street access alternative, particularly as it relates to traffic impacts. Because the final EIR did not result in the identification of any new significant impacts or a substantial, substantial increase in the severity of any environmental impacts, the final EIR does not contain what CEQA considers significant new information and a recirculation is not required pursuant to Section 15088.5 of the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, during environmental review, we received two letters from Caltrans. The issues raised in those letters were discussed in the final EIR. Uh, however, just yesterday, we received a new comment from Caltrans, which you each have a copy of. Uh, before I move on to a recommendation, I'd like to turn it over to our traffic engineer, Stephanie Holloway, to share our response to the letter. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, Stephanie Holloway with Public Works. Um, like Jerry stated, we do, we do have a um, response to the Caltrans email that we got on, on Tuesday from our traffic consultant, Omni Means, who is here today, um, if you have any questions. As a matter of additional clarification, uh, two of the issues that the email on Tuesday brought up um, that Caltrans wrote, one is uh, the possible need for an additional southbound left turn lane at the intersection of Hulbert, which is the access to Highway 49 and uh, Highway 49. We did actually, um, during the administrative phase of this project, when we first saw the traffic study for this, for this particular project, the, this issue was raised. There, um, there is an additional amount of traffic turning southbound left at that intersection with the project. And, and um, at that time, we did raise this issue with Caltrans to try to identify whether the need for um, an additional southbound left turn lane and a requirement by Caltrans would be placed on this project to build that. Um, at that time, Caltrans indicated to us that because of the operation of that signal and the corridor timing of the signals on Highway 49, that the existing left turn pocket would be sufficient to handle that additional traffic. Um, and just as a technical clarification, the, the signal at this location runs as a lead lag. So what that means um, in layman's turn is the, um, the southbound movements all happen at the same time. So all the through movements and the left turn movements all turn green at the same time. So there's no need for what we call a deceleration distance in that left turn pocket. And that's the concern is that the additional traffic that would um, store in that left turn pocket would essentially take up the room that we allocate for deceleration um, outside of the through lane in the left turn pocket. So that, this matter was uh, raised to Caltrans. We did actually meet with them um, to discuss it. There was a, a big concern on staff's part that if we um, needed to design essentially a, a modification of the signal, to require, to allow that second left turn lane, um, that that needed to be identified early in the project. Um, again, Caltrans indicated to us that the existing facility that we see today would be adequate to, to serve the additional traffic. Um, and then as a second matter of clarification, the email brings up a, um, a concern over the internal intersection, and you can see it up here on this, this diagram. Uh, the internal intersection with the proposed access and the plaza access, the existing plaza access. Caltrans is, was very concerned about how this particular intersection would operate because it does have implications to the um, adjacent intersection with Highway 49. If there was a um, you know, substantial delay um, at that intersection, that the, it may create a backup onto Highway 49, which they're very concerned about. Um, we heard those comments at that time. 
the project um, access was revised to the current configuration that you see here today. Um, I did speak with Marty Earls uh, with Caltrans on Tuesday to clarify that he was looking at an old figure, a figure out of the traffic study that uh, was about a year old or so. Um, it did make reference to this, this particular uh, site plan that you're seeing today. Um, at that time, he indicated that, 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 that this configuration um, would eliminate any, any concerns that he would have. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Stephanie. Yep. Well, yeah, I have, I have a question. I guess just the thought occurs to me that uh, as time goes by, if uh, two left lanes become apparent as a need, uh, is there room there to put in an extra left lane? Um, Without a major, you know, I, I don't, I don't know the, that I can answer that. I, I think that there, there is a configuration that we have looked at in the past um, when the Walmart came through and and was looked at at that point. Um, we did look at the, um, we did look at the same issue, and at that time we had determined that there, there was enough room in there to maybe not get a full, additional left turn pocket, um, but maybe something. Um, that gives us a little additional storage, uh, but wasn't a full pocket that would um, that that we could fit between the intersection with with Hulbert and the railroad over crossing, which is really our our main constraint along the along the highway. So there, we we have looked at it not not particularly with this project because, as I indicated, Caltrans wasn't concerned with it at that time. But we have looked at it in the past. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, as stated in the staff report, we have determined that the project is consistent with the Auburn Bowman Community Plan land use designation and also with the underlying zoning, both of which are commercial. Uh, and as shown in, in the EIR, all potential environmental impacts are considered less than significant with or without mitigation, aside from certain traffic and uh, cumulative air quality impacts. These significant unavoidable impacts to area traffic and air quality are considered acceptable as stated in the Statement of Overriding Considerations. In total, there are 136 conditions of approval, which will ensure that the project impacts to adjacent neighbors and properties in the community at large will not be detrimental to the health, safety, and general welfare of those living and working in the area. Staff recommends the Planning Commission approve the conditional use permit and the minor use permit based on the findings and subject to the conditions of approval that are contained in the staff report. Additionally, staff recommends the Planning Commission take action to certify the final EIR and adopt the findings of fact and the statement of overriding considerations as presented. And that concludes this presentation, unless you have some questions. Thank you, Jerry. Do any of the commissioners have questions for Mr. Huff? I guess not. Thank you. Does the applicant wish to address the commission? Yes. Good morning. I'm Jim Conkey. I'm from Roseville, California. I'm the project uh, applicant and also the property owner. Uh, I just want to say that I have read the staff report. I agree with its findings, its recommendations, and conditions of approval. Uh, again, it's important to note that the only uh, significant and unavoidable impacts are in transportation and air quality. And no matter what potential use or project that is ever proposed on this still has the same significant and unavoidable impacts in these areas. Uh, just one last thing. Some people here today are going to try to turn this hearing into a speculation or debate about possible users. This hearing should be about the proposed use, its environmental impacts and mitigations, not about a possible user uh, that may or may not be in a project. Thank you. I will be available for you to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conkey. Any questions for him? Rich? Yeah, this question may be addressed to more to uh, Engineering, the the uh, <clears throat> transportation problem is, at least I'm understanding that it can't be corrected. Is that related to the Dry Creek intersection? Is that specifically? Sorry, can, or is it can you state other that again? Things too. Can you state that again? Huh? Your concern is the significant unavoidable impact. Uh, yeah, the unavoidable impact. Uh, at least my impression is this: the Dry Creek uh, 49 intersection that causes that to be uh, an unavoidable impact? Yeah, there's, there's a number of um, locations that we identified significant and unavoidable, um, specifically in the cumulative section. 
Um, when we looked at the traffic study, there's a, there's a number of different things that we look at when we look at a traffic study. We look at the operation of, of intersections. Um, that gives us an indication of how the intersections themselves are, are handling the traffic. Um, we also look at um, the segments, the, the areas between the intersections and how, how the traffic is, is being handled there. Two additional things that we looked at in this traffic study was the level of service of the ramps, the, the ramps to um, the state highways. Um, and then also we looked at lane queuing. So um, particularly where at intersections where we have right turn lanes and left turn lanes, as the cumulative traffic ramps up, um, those, those facilities um, start to break down. So we, we start to lose capacity in those left turn lanes, similar to the, the issue that we just spoke of with the Hulbert um, at, uh, at Highway 49 uh, location. So the areas that we identified significant and unavoidable were in the segments um, at Highway 49 and Bell. Um, there's, there is a need for a northbound right turn lane at that location. Um, there is no feasible, um, we determined that there was no feasible um, infrastructure that we can put in because of the constraints that we have with the existing businesses. Um, to, to be able to mitigate that. So um, there we identified significant and unavoidable. Um, there was also a significant and unavoidable um, for the lane queuing at um, 49 and Dry Creek as well as 49 and Willow Creek. So those two locations we identified um, a cumulative a future scenario where the available left turn pocket, right turn pocket storage um, was not going to be adequate to be able to handle the cumulative um, plus project uh, um, traffic at that location. Is, is that the result of this project or is this just something inherent in the roadway as it exists today? It's, it's something that is inherent in the cumulative traffic, so the overall growth of the community as well as through traffic that's been identified through the community, um, that creates the significant not avoidable problem. The project traffic adds to that cumulative scenario and therefore come, shows up as significant not avoidable. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, any more questions on staff for the applicant? I guess not. Then we come to that portion of the hearing where you all get a chance to address us on the matter. Um, first of all, I'd like to tell you all that we do have all of your letters, all of them, and we've read every single one. Um, and towards that end, a gentleman approached us this morning and said he couldn't stay with us. His name is uh, Merle Filippi. Philippi, Philippi, any event, he gave us a letter. He's in support of the project, and I'm going to hand this uh, pink-colored note to our clerk for inclusion as part of the record, if you would, please. Secondly, I'd like to ask the fellow commissioners, um, because of the number of people who want to talk, it could get a little lengthy. I would recommend to you all that we uh, impose the same limit on speeches that the Board of Supervisors uses, and that's three minutes per person. Uh, any objection if we do that? Okay, then I would ask the clerk to get her timer ready, and each of you will be limited to three minutes. And um, with that, I, I won't call on you individually. If you want to speak, just come up when the other person's done. Tell us your name and say what you have to say. I would remind you, though, this is not a referendum on on Walmart, and a lot of your letters go into the pros and cons of Walmart. Uh, this is really, we're looking at the use. So if you want to uh, limit your comments to the use, we'd like to hear what you have to say. Sir, you're standing. Come right on up. My name is Ron Paytich. I've lived in Auburn about 30 years. I support development. In fact, I was uh, responsible for bringing the coherent laser plant to Auburn in 1981. We've enjoyed living here. I support uh, Mr. Conkey and his uh, efforts to put in a project. And I support appropriate uh, project, um, despite your comments, and uh, try to limit comments against Walmart. Uh, I will speak, uh, speak to that. I hope the commission will see it uh, appropriate to encourage businesses that will be an enhancement to the community. I judge that uh, services Walmart are adequately served now by Target, um, the um, Kmart and the uh, variety of markets in town. Um, from all that we read on services, uh, or I should say the uh, benefits and wages that Costco and Walmart pay, 
uh, Walmart is inferior, paying a substandard wage and limiting benefits. Um, I'm sure Mr. Conkey's major interest is to simply find a tenant and sell his project. Um, I would ask you to encourage businesses that would be an enhancement to the community. Uh, I believe Costco is a candidate as well. Uh, Walmart, I judge, would be perhaps a burden on the community in that it would create a second class uh, employee which may become a burden on our community and our county. Whereas with the superior pay and benefits given by Walmart, uh, we would be better off. Sorry, thank you. My apologies. <laughs> Costco. So uh, I would ask that you, to the extent possible, you encourage businesses that would be an enhancement to the community. Thank, thank you, Mr. Petich. Appreciate your comments. Go ahead. My name is Del Rapini, and I'm in the same business. I'm a developer and a contractor. And I think this project is well needed in this town. It's not only taxes, benefits, brings money into the city, and employment into the city. The other concern I have why I'm here today is the fact that this is a zone piece of property. And I don't understand why everybody has to jump through these hoops on a zone piece of property. It would seem to me that when you have a piece of property that's been zoned for 26 years, you can come in here with a set of plans, a traffic report, and get ready to get building permits. And that is my concern, that we're regulating ourselves, regulating ourselves so we can't do anything. Our hands are tied all the time. And I do not have a dog in this race. I'm just here as an individual speaking my mind about what's happening in this state and why we should start loosening the reins a little bit and letting some stuff happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good morning. My name is Lee Lively. I am a member of the APACE Alliance at 1702 Tracy Lane. Uh, before I make a statement, I am perplexed as to why the chairman persists in this charade of Costco. And we pretend that we do not know who the, the occupant uh, will be. Many people know. I hope the chairman and the board know. I note that you will preside over the approval of the Bohemia Walmart project, including a permit for the Walmart monument out on Highway 49, and that you claim that five pathetically dubious benefits as overriding considerations that outweigh the many significant adverse effects of this project, and that you deem citizens' arguments regarding economy and crime to be less than significant, and that you deem citizens' arguments regarding traffic and air quality to be significant but unavoidable, and that you are proceeding toward approving a project even though the Placer County Sheriff's Department, the Fire Department, and Cal Fire, and the Water Agency have not agreed to service this project. I spoke with Caltrans two days ago. I visited their office in Maryville spoke with their chief. They are concerned about this traffic on 49 and Luther, which you folks seem to have ignored. We at the Pace Alliance are anxious to examine your chain of logic that led this commission to approve this project. Thank you. I don't know what it is. I don't know, maybe you My name is Marie Murphy. I've been an Auburn resident for 46 years, and I'm in for approval of this project. I think a Walmart store is long overdue in this area. Everybody else has come to this area in the past 46 years. Why not Walmart? And I support Walmart over Costco, because Costco is a membership store. There's a $50 membership. 
And I'm, I'm sure that most of those who are approving the Costco store are already holding cards for that store and see a virtual opportunity not to have to drive to Sacramento anymore to exercise their card. This would be really convenient for them to have a Costco store right here in their own backyard. Walmart store is an everybody store. Everybody and anybody can go to Walmart. And I've shopped in Walmart down in Sacramento. They have quality, quality goods. They, are, they have an extensive inventory. And it is a really super store to have. And I think the Walmart store will be, be the one if we're Auburn. Thank you. Come on up, but if you'll wait just a second. You can wait at the mic. Um, I want to respond to Mr. Lively, and Larry, you started to do this just a second ago. He was describing knowledge to me that I don't have. No I idea. have no idea if there's a <clears throat> tenant scheduled. Uh, I've not been informed. Does anybody else on the commission have any contrary information? Well, and I guess my deal is, as a commissioner, I'm not here to make any evaluations of what the end user is. It's what the, you know, what the project is, the building and use. But do you know who the end user is? No, I don't. Yeah, yeah we simply but don't. I know I don't have any say over that. And have, we haven't approved squat, have we? So, in any event, I just wanted you all to know that. We don't know. If there is one, we don't know who it is. So, ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Please come forward. <clears throat> when I came in here today, I, Joan Smith, uh, I live in one of those mobile homes right there. When I came in today, I asked which side was the groom side. Because as we know, in a wedding, the groom usually doesn't have much to say. <laughs> and I wanted to be in the right group because I figured <laughs> they were all going to pounce on me when I got through. The thing that brought me here today was because it made my Portuguese blood boil to hear these people call the owner of this place a liar. That's a terrible thing. And I don't believe the man is lying. I think he's trying to build a business. And I think that any business that came here that was reputable would be wonderful for Auburn. And I'm 79, very few days. I've lived in a lot of places where Walmart was, Costco was, and all of that. And I've never seen them bring any disruption to any other business. I feel that, I feel that if your business is failing, it's usually one of three things. Either you never have the supplies that we need, or you don't carry what we like, or the attitude. And the attitude, gentlemen, to me is the most important. And I, I referenced that because I was in an Auburn gas station on a Sunday getting gas. There was a lady attendant and a, and a young man. And a young couple came in, not young. They were in their 50s, 60s. And they asked, is there anyone here that could uh, fill a, you know, a tire? We, ha we have a flat tire. No, there's nobody here. We don't do that. Well, could I borrow a lug wrench? And the boy said, we don't have those. We don't work on cars. So he said, well, could you please just tell me if there's a place here that I can go to get my tire fixed? And he said, the boy said, well, there's a body shop right there on the corner. And he said, oh, and the boy says, but this is Sunday. It's not open. And he said, oh, and the woman spoke up. And he said, well, is there any place in town that can help me? And the woman spoke up and very nastily said, not in this town. And I thought, those people aren't going to come back to Auburn once they get that tire fix and get out of here. And I'll bet all their families and their friends aren't going to come to Auburn either. And that's terrible, because Auburn's a beautiful city, beautiful city. But it makes me cry the negativity that's in this town. It, most people are against everything. But I have found that most of the people that are arguing against this are the people that are living right around it. And why should they be the ones to decide for all of Auburn 
that this store, that any of those stores are going to hurt us. Because they're not. They're going to bring business. I shop at Walmart. But I go to other stores, too, and I will continue to shop at Walmart. But I still continue to shop here in Auburn at the stores that I like. So that's all I have to say, and I probably should grab my purse and run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pardon me. One more thing. I want you all to see my face, because if I'm lucky enough to have Walmart come here, I will be one of the low-life people waiting on you. And I promise you, I will treat you with respect. Thank you. <laughs> Joan, we may disagree, but we're still friends and neighbors, and we all live together. So I don't think you have anything to worry about. <laughs> My name is Henry Silva, and I'll be brief. I'll allow her the extra time on mine. <laughs> uh, I'm in favor of this project, just for the Matter of fact, it's going to bring jobs, about 300 extra jobs to the community and the tax base that this city can use, uh, I think will be a huge benefit. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Joan Levon. I'm a resident in the area here. And I want to just read to you what I'm reading in this EIR uh, conditional permit. On page 15, under alternatives, uh, mixed-use alternative, the mixed-use alternative includes approximately 35 percent reduction in the square footage as compared to the proposed project. Furthermore, the alternative would include two separate retail buildings, one uh, 64,300 square foot building and one 35,700 um, square foot building, <clears throat> rather than one um, 150 5,000 square foot building as proposed for the project. The mixed used alternative would eliminate the proposed fueling station, relocate the proposed parking areas to the northwest portion of the site. The mixed used alternative would have fewer impacts to visual resources, public services and utilities, and hazardous materials and hazards as compared to the proposed project. Environmentally superior alternative. The mixed-use alternative is the environmentally superior alternative to the proposed project because this alternative would result in a reduction in some impacts while achieving the majority of the proposed project's objectives. There's your answer. And I do not understand why they, the county um, planning can say that this was not an issue. It is. It is an important issue, and it would satisfy a lot of people in this room and otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. My name is Larry Needle. I've been a homeowner on 13180 Aaron Drive for 28 years, a member of Fiddler Green Homeowners Association, and also a member of the APACE community group. Uh, all my concerns and comments against this project have been presented at one time or another, either in writing or in person, before the MAC Committee, Planning Commission, or Board of Supervisors, and I do want to just sum up my concerns now. I have a packet that I want to present to you today uh, as my original 10-page EIR, or draft EIR comment, presented in March to the Pl Planning Commission was misplaced and not included in the final EIR, which violation of the Brown Act. But it was later added as an erratum when I questioned its deletion. So I don't want you to lose my other comments. Uh, I request you not to certify the final EIR report and not adopt the findings of the fact uh, report on the Bohemia project due to the following realities. The developer has not identified attendant either with uh, the 155,000 square foot building or any mixed use alternative. I think we as the public need to know so we can address the impacts of either. The project will add an insurmountable amount of traffic to the one point of ingress and egress at Holbert Way and Highway 49. In fact, the findings of fact and statement of order, or, excuse me, overriding considerations adopted by the Placer County Planning Commission state significant and unavoidable impacts, especially with traffic and air quality, especially with relation to asbestos release since the building intends to be dug into the northeast corner. Uh, the mitigation re measure to reduce the noise includes a six to eight foot wall along Canal Street, which I don't feel is high enough 
uh, to mitigate anything uh, but potentially attractive feedy. The mitigation measure to camouflage the noise and negative visual aesthetics on the planned retail building uh, is a, a violation of PG&E and California state regulation codes as the trees uh, planned to be planted there are planned uh, beneath high voltage power lines. Uh, there's going to be destruction of mature native oak trees. And my one last concern is the appearance of a conflict of interest. I was assured by the project planner that the developer was responsible to pay all studies required by the planning department. And yet there was a memorandum dated September 2008 that states uh, the Auburn Redevelopment Agency funded over $55,000 for a study that was quoted in the Bohemia Project Draft EIR and the final EIR. Thank you. If you would give those to the clerk, please. We'll try not to lose them. Thank you. Sir? Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Baxman. I uh, am a resident on Dyer Court in Country Club Estates. Um, by some, I've been called one of the mob, and I'm objecting to this project. And I came here hoping to feel optimistic, but part of me feels the project is a done deal. I hope you can see through a lot of the false information out there regarding this project. And if you look at your map, my home, is sixth house down on the left, immediately right next to the project. And stating that this project will not affect me is really not true. Uh, I don't know how many of you have visited the location of the site into our neighborhood, uh, saw what was around it, but it is not the right project for this property. This is the third time that a large retail, Walmart large retail, has been proposed on this project property. And I don't know what makes it better today than it did back in 1992, 1994. Um, when I bought this property where I live today, the so-called property was zoned industrial. Contrary to what has been written about how it's been zoned for shopping center is not true. Uh, it's been written that the project was zoned MPDC. Planning Commission or Department has no such zoning. I have a tax, tax inquiry from the assessor's office which has MPDC on it, uh, made me wonder, was I right, was I wrong? So I went to the supervisor at the assessor's office. MPDC is a code used in the processing of tax forms. It's not a zoning. And in fact, in 1994, or excuse me, in a proposed Walmart was in 1991, a Walmart was proposed for the site. It was voted down by the supervisors for many reasons, obviously zoning. So in June 1994, not 84 as it has been written, that the property was rezoned during the Auburn Bowman general plan as changed from industrial to commercial. Highway 49 is a mess now. Highway 49 is a state highway. The state highway is meant to move traffic from point A to point B, Auburn, Grass Valley, Nevada City. It's not a built for a shopping corridor, such as Galleria Boulevard, Five Star Boulevard. So, and being so close to the project with heating, air conditioning, parking lots, exhaust fumes, 
uh, asbestos in the ground. Uh, these are all going to affect every homeowner in this subdivision long after we're gone, the owner is gone, and uh, I feel that you people should do the right thing and reject this project on merits that it is not good for me, my neighbors, my neighborhood, or Auburn as a whole. And today you're here to represent Auburn, not Roseville, Lincoln, Grassville, or Colfax, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Victoria Connolly, a member of APACE. For the purpose of the record, I'm noting submissions to the Planning Commission and to the Pub Planning Department, some of which were done during public co comment. I want to make sure they're uh, noted today. May 26th, I detailed the socioeconomic effects of Walmart on communities. Uh, I indicated that a separate review for a Walmart big box was needed as it has specialized impacts on communities. I also, on June 25th, I, in a document entitled Inadequacy of the EIR for Bohemia uh, Project, noted sales tax issues, provided aerial views of Sacramento area big boxes, none of which is near a residential area, and noted our Facebook membership of nearly 550 people against Walmart and Auburn. July 6th, um, the FEIR, FEIR comments, I noted that this was a deviation from the Auburn Bowman Community Plan and the associated EIR with that plan. I noted that there was a violation of the rights of neighbors to enjoy their property, that that was not in fact considered. Uh, only the rights of the developer to develop have been discussed. I noted cost to the county of potential inverse condemnation suits and CEQA suit and lost revenue because of jobs uh, businesses and uh, uh, taxes. I also handed to the MAC and to uh, at the um, on the sixth the crime statistics from Lompoc Police, comparing two months of calls for Walmart, which was 122 calls, versus Costco in the same area of 48 calls for two months. In addition, I submitted a letter to Michael Johnson detailing the attempts to squelch public comment at various meetings constituting a potential violation of the Brown Act. I also noted a, a failure uh, to, to uh, note a Rodham in the Gold Country media. The traffic study indicates mostly easy flow, but I wonder why there is going to be a bottleneck at New Airport and Bell because it's a shortcut. I hope Mr. Conkey has a mixed-use proposal uh, if this is found to be inadequate under CEQA as it was 10 years ago. I also note that Mr. Donahue, a member of APACE, has found that 108 uh, safety-related calls went into the mobile home park. We wonder how that's going to get through the traffic, ambulances, example, for example, through the traffic. ABCD, ABCP is the controlling document. It notes there, the Bohemia area will require special design attention to ensure it is not intrusive to existing uh, uses particularly residential. It provides for current buffers to be maintained near residential mixed uses, the proposed uh, development, and it encourages professional offices of low intensity as a buffer. If you try to put, uh, manipulate this big box or strip malls, no matter how much you are trying to put lipstick on a pig, there is no way this conforms to the ABC plan or the EIR for that plan. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Carol Lou Wilson, and I'm here to speak in support of the project. 160 years ago, my family came to Auburn. They left their native land and they brought their money and they brought their knowledge. And they planted the orchards you see around Auburn. They planted the vineyards. They taught the knowledge. Part of it is being restored at the Bernhard Museum. 
The family ranch is now your Gold Country Fairgrounds. The property extended to the Old Flint Station and up to your regional park. Now, 26 years ago, this property was zoned for retail commercial development. And I believe that in the same spirit of free enterprise that brought my family here 160 years ago, that the developer has the right to develop his property in accordance with the zoning that exists on the property. And I appreciate your time, gentlemen. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jim Lanetta, and I live on Aaron Drive in the neighborhood. I'm strongly opposed to this project, and the main reason is the size and scale of it. The, the issue here isn't whether this is a Walmart or a Costco or a Lowe's or whether we need jobs or we need tax money. The issue is, is this project appropriate for this location? This is what you're going to decide on today, if I'm correct. Now, the, the Auburn Bowman Community Plan states, quote, height and scale of new development shall be compatible with that of surrounding development. This clearly is not compatible with a neighborhood. It's within 100 feet of the people on Dyer Court. Now, I don't know how the, the county can say that this complies with the Auburn Bowman Community Plan when it, it just simply doesn't. Uh, now, in Mr. Kavolt's uh, ad in the journal, he used um, some other stores as a comparison to this project. Target, uh, Home Depot, and Staples. Now, Target is 97,000 square feet on 10 acres. Home Depot is 105,000 square feet on 11 acres. Both of those are nowhere near a neighborhood. The Staples, the whole shopping center in Staples is less than four acres. The entire Staples shopping center, I means Staples store and all the small businesses around it, and the entire parking lot would fit inside that building. That's how big that building is. It's three and a half acres large. That, a, size, a building that size does not belong next to a single family residential neighborhood. It's just the size and scale of it. Now, there should be some buffer zone or a green belt. An eight-foot fence isn't going to cut it. This thing is going to be this huge building right next to the neighborhood. That's the problem. That's the issue. Is this appropriate for this location? And it isn't. And, you know, our neighborhood isn't trying to decide what the entire county needs, whether we need a Walmart or jobs. It has nothing to do with that. This is our neighborhood. We live there. We're going to have to live with this, this thing for, forever. And we don't want it to ruin our neighborhood. That's the issue. Now, now as far as jobs go, there's some people with signs back there, we need jobs. Of course we need jobs. We're not deciding whether we need jobs or not. We're deciding whether this is the right project. And if any, any business is going to go to, into, a business, into a building this size is going to be a huge business. That's not the kind of growth that Auburn needs. Auburn needs small businesses. That's what grows our economy is small business. A small business cannot afford to go into a building this size. That's not the kind of jobs or growth that we need in Auburn. And if you put, a, if you put Walmart or whatever it is, it's going to put other small businesses out of jobs, so there will be even more people looking for jobs. Now, I just ask that you don't approve this, this project. Thank you. My name is Carol Arve. I'm a member of APACE, and I live in the Fiddler Green development. And I've submitted as many potential things wrong as I could in the other data. Today I have questions that I expect to be answered. Looking at all the road improvements that are supposed to be happening to mitigate the traffic thing, I would like you to define for me what is fair share and what is the taxpayer total cost beyond fair share? Go ahead and just list out your questions, and when we bring the staff back up after everybody's done questioning, we'll see if we can get the answers to you at that time. Okay. And I hope we actually can, because I think this is significant. Okay. I also like to know who pays for the $400,000 planning department cost to work on this project. And I'd also like to know what is the real, real cost of exceeding air pollution limits? What are the costs to the environment? And what are the costs to human health, including children, which live in the adjacent neighborhoods? 
Um, I also beg that you eliminate a fueling station next to canal possibility of leakage, et cetera, et cetera, is an environmental hazard that we do not need. There are more than enough fueling stations in this community. Um, big is not beautiful or economically sound. Thank you. Thank you. Before, before you start, how many more folks here want to address the commission? Can I just see a show of hand? What I'd like to do, ma'am, after you in the, the purple dress there, is we'll stop public comment at that point. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll resume. You'll get to talk. I, if there just comes a point in time where you can't sit still any longer. Thank you, sir. Of course. Uh, my name is Jason Long. I teach environmental studies at Placer High School. Um, and the, a lot of what's already been spoken, um, I, I would second. Uh, Jim pretty much said a lot of what I'm, I'm going to say, so I'll try not to be too, too redundant. But um, one of the biggest concerns I have that it, I, I find it odd that EIRs don't consider this is the larger scope of an environmental impact. And uh, what I mean specifically is whether it's Walmart, whether it's uh, Costco, Lowe's, any of these big box stores, um, they have created one of the biggest problems facing the world and facing America, and that is extremely low prices at the expense of disastrous economic, environmental, um, and community uh, impacts. The, the, the true hidden cost of these big box stores is incredibly damaging. Um, I don't know whether there is a good mixed alternative possibility for this. I would not have a particular problem with that. My issue is one of the big box megastore, whoever it is. And if it's a 155,000 square foot building, it will be a gigantic business. It will not be anybody small. And I only came to Auburn 30 years ago, so I don't have the, the centuries that some of you have in your family, so I may not be able to speak uh, with as much authority. But um, I can say without hyperbole that my wife and I have already started looking for housing and employment elsewhere. Um, if, if this does turn into a megastore, I, I will move. Placer will lose a teacher. Uh, my two kids will not go to school in this community. I, I'll have to move probably to uh, at least another city, if not another state, um, that, that holds true to the, the ideals that, that my family held when they moved to Auburn in 1980. That was our whole point for moving to a town like Auburn, was that um, it, it had a lot of local business and it supported local business. Um, my mother owns a local business in town, and, and, and the, any one of these stores would potentially threaten her, and nobody messes with my mom. Um, so, you know, if you have time, I would urge all, anyone here to go online and check out a website called The Story of Stuff, and it will uh, illuminate this issue of big box stores and the problem with those. So uh, if, you, if you can encourage a mixed use, I guess if something has to be built there, that's where my vote would go. Thank you very much. My name is Sandy Ferguson. I have only one comment. I cannot understand how any reasonable person cannot see the gridlock that's going to occur on 49. Thank you. My name is Jerry Kopp. I'm a local business owner and 40-year resident of Auburn. Uh, through the years, I have watched who knows how many projects have been turned down. It is to the point where we can no longer function. My small business has 13 agencies that monitor us. We need to put people back to work. This is going to put people back to work just building it, the construction of the highway, the jobs that it will perform. And believe me, being in small business, Walmart pays better than most of the small businesses in town. And we need to do something. Gentlemen, we have to get moving. Our community is falling apart. Houses are half built. We need to get to work. And we need to have all this opposition. We need to get to work. We're not putting people to work. I watch every day guys come in and tell me they're losing their house, they're closing their business. It has gotten to the point between the environmentalist, 
Well, Rich, you've heard me scream and yell all the time. Between the county, between this and that, you can't do anything. You know, it's like living in a communist country. Let the guy build the building. Let's get some people back to work. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carrie Dawson Bartley. I'm here about the proposed big box store, Walmart, whatever we, you want to call it. In some ways, I'm glad that I've been able to follow this controversy because it's really opened my eyes. I used to think that our community representatives actually, well, they were here to actually represent us. Unfortunately, the North Auburn Mac voted to represent one resident of Granite Bay and his one piece of property over the hundreds of homeowners and businesses of North Auburn and ignored our community plan in the process. All this under the guise that we will be better off for it. I hope the Planning Commission is not as naive about the negative ramifications of a Walmart big box in our community and Placer County as a whole. From pollution to crime to socioeconomic impacts, this proposal is a very bad idea. It's a bad idea that a few tax dollars shifted around the county will not mitigate. I have personally spoken to hundreds of people and knocked on doors from Newcastle to Meadow Vista, and more than 80% are opposed to this big box development. They are Republicans, Democrats, Independents. Some have been here a lifetime, some have not. What unites them is that they want to maintain the great quality of life in Auburn that is disappearing with every irresponsible development. I'm a registered Republican, and yes, I am protecting my own property rights by opposing this project, which will encroach on my neighborhood but I am not a so-called NIMBY. My concern is for the Auburn area and Placer County as a whole. I do not want uncontrolled, irresponsible development that only results in an unending spiral of growing government services, taxes, and more irresponsible growth. I am also very much opposed to Walmart, the likely tenant on this property, for, this support, for their support of federal government health care programs. And I have personally seen Walmart kill the community of small businesses in more than one location where I've lived. And part of the reason I moved here, literally like the teacher said, is that uh, I wanted to not live in a place like Roseville with uh, huge box stores. Despite the superior service and other positive attributes of small businesses, shopping locally is the way to go, and that's who will be hurt. Mm -hmm. My fellow members of APACE and I urged the Planning Commission to vote against the irresponsible development contained in the Bohemia Project proposal. I would personally support a mixed-use, low-impact proposal as required by, for this type of property by our Auburn Bowman Community Plan. But unfortunately that, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be on the agenda today. Thank you. I'm also attaching a copy of a letter that I read before this commission on April 22nd, as I want to be sure it's actually entered in the records and not lost. If details, uh, it details several areas in which the Bohemia Project fails to comply with the Auburn Bowman Community Plan. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, let's continue. Okay, if we can come back to order, who wants to address the commission next? If so, it's your turn. You get to start. <laughs> My name is Lolita Taylor, and uh, my family purchased property on Bell Road in 1913 or 15, and uh, the family has continued to own property in Auburn uh, since that time. Now, of course, I don't expect that uh, things can go backward or <laughs> uh, to the time when all there was on 49 were Mariposa's the lilies and baby blue eyes and shooting stars. And the only business was a gasoline alley where the canal crosses 49. But um, uh, I do believe that people who have moved to this community are more interested, uh, have been interested, many of them anyway, in uh, uh, coming here because of the atmosphere of this community. And uh, a part of the atmosphere is mom and pop stores and, and uh, uh, businesses of that kind, uh, and I do understand that uh, a lot of people now are traveling down to Galleria and so on to purchase otherwise, but um, I, I feel that uh, this area that is proposed is inappropriate for a big box store and that that would be more uh, 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 a, a place for uh, community homes and that sort of thing. And I don't see why we can't start building something else rather than that. I mean, why the property can't be used or something else. I do honestly believe it will impact the uh, area negatively and that um, uh, as I live off of Luther Road and have been traveling up and down 49, uh, I find that sometimes we have to stop if, while the signal still says go on 49 we have to stop at the intersection because there is so much traffic jamming the area. So I, I would welcome a big box store up near the freeway, but not here. I think it's inappropriate. Thank you. It is still morning, good morning. Uh, my name is Alan Levon. I live on Aaron Drive, and my wife spoke a little bit earlier. Now, uh, uh, I, was a, I was a high school teacher for 30 years, and I'm used to being ignored. Uh, so, uh, but as you could tell, a lot of us are not used to being ignored. And although Mr. Conkey would like you uh, 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 to uh, not uh, consider what, well, he wants you, uh, he wants you to uh, consider just what he is going to be doing. He's trying to tell you what you should and should not consider. Uh, I believe that being a, a resident in the area of this, whatever is going to go in here, uh, that we as the residents have a right to know what it is that's going to be put right next, right next door to us, whether it's a Walmart or, K, or a, a, a Costco or maybe just a, a, a fast food place. I don't know. I don't care what's going to go in there, but I think before you make your consideration regarding what, what, whether to approve or disapprove this project, that you, that you take into consideration uh, what the residents have to say, because we are the ones that are going to have to live with this, as was somebody once said, for a long, long time. And that's all I'm going to say, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good morning. My name is David Keyes. I'm an 18-year resident of the neighborhood adjacent to this project. I'm here this morning to ask your commission to require three specific reasonable mitigation measures for this project. First, there is a very large oak tree immediately to the west of the intersection of Canal and Aaron Drive. All persons leaving our neighborhood are afforded a view of this magnificent oak each day. It's my sincerest hope that this project could be developed with the same respect for large oak growth oaks as was displayed in the Safeway Center. I ask specifically that you require the developer to partner with county planning staff to create a building and driveway design around this tree 
such as to preserve some of the natural beauty that exists on this site. This one tree can be saved with your support. Please direct the developer and county staff to work together to save this beautiful tree. Second is my understanding that truck deliveries will be prohibited between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. I'm very grateful that the county staff recognizes the sound from truck deliveries will escape the sound mitigation measures and has made this recommendation. I am specifically asking that you expand the hours of this restriction to align them with the Placer County Noise Ordinance, which recognizes receptors are more sensitive between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. I recognize the ERR claims the noise ordinance sound limits will not be exceeded. However, the same logic that recognizes the value to the adjoining neighborhood of limited delivery hours would recognize that only six hours of peace is not reasonable. Please expand this mitigation to cover the same hours we as a county have already recognized as hours deserving a greater level of peace and quiet. Please restrict truck deliveries from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. This mitigation request is reasonable. Thirdly, I understand there will be a large sound wall built along the Canal Street side of this project. While I'm grateful for this requirement, I am concerned, particularly in the early years of this project, this will be a large canvas for graffiti vandals. I understand that the developer is required to plant landscaping that will over time diminish the likelihood of such vandalism. However, it may be many years before those plants mature. My neighborhood has been vandalized several times by graffiti. I am specifically asking for the commission to require as a condition of approval that the developer construct the wall out of materials that are graffiti resistant such that they are easier to clean and less attractive to vandals and that the developer or tenant be required to clean any graffiti within 48 hours. Since this will be the backside of this project without such a requirement, the tenant has little incentive to care about this back wall. For our neighborhood, this is our front yard, not some back alley. Please require these vandalism prevention measures while we wait for the landscaping to mature. I thank you for your time and ask you to make specific conditions related to these three requests. Mr. Keyes? Yes, sir. Let me see, uh, just for clarification, I'm looking at uh, condition number 17, which limits uh, deliveries between the hours of uh, 6 a.m. and 12 a.m. Correct, midnight and 6 a.m. So that's the current restriction. I'm asking you to expand those hours to 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., that there would be no deliveries during those hours. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Ardeth Gray, and I live in Woodside Mobile Home Park. I'm very concerned that for the 500 plus parking slots in the proposed area, is going to have a negative effect on our air, considering that people stay at Walmart about two hours, we'll probably see about seven to 10,000 cars a day. I cannot believe that an environmental impact left that out. And an eight to a 10 foot wall is not going to stop exhaust. As it is, our little mobile home park hears every sound on Highway 49, every siren, and the new uh, intersection has brought a lot of noise to our area too. I can't imagine that 10,000 cars coming to our little 49 is not going to bring exhaust dangerous uh, situations, and uh, you guys haven't considered this. I, I heard somebody say, oh, the impact study has been done. I cannot believe that. Who would want 10,000 cars near their home every day? Which of you would want that? And that's all I have to say, thank you. My name is June Gillum, and um, 
I, uh, unlike a lot of these, oops, I just moved to Auburn last month. I bought a house in Sullivan Ranch, and I was really looking forward to the small town life of Auburn. But since I've been here, I've been noticing how hard it is to get down 49. And now when I think of having even more traffic, especially at New Airport Road and 49, it just makes me heart sick. Um, and uh, I have a question. Um, I, I, would pr I would prefer um, the mixed use possibility, if that would be a possibility still, for the small town aspect. Um, and then in case it does uh, turn out to be a Walmart, um, my question, I didn't realize we had a chance to ask questions, but we do. Will we get our questions answered? Good question. <laughs> OK. I just wondered if there's a possibility for uh, public input later when we do learn what the tenant will be? Uh, I think the answer is no. Scott? Yes, Scott Finley, County Council. Um, no, you approve the use once the user only goes through a design review of the actual building itself. So, so the answer. So there's no input at all then after this. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Charlie Nickrens. I'm a resident of uh, Fillers Green Homeowners uh, Association. That's kind of noisy. Um, I'm going to step behind this eight-foot wall over here because Mr. Conkey said that will eliminate all sound. So I'll, I'll be right back. Show and tell time. Nice donuts back there. I um, had a couple questions. I'd like to leave them for you, too, after I'm done here. Um, is it generally your job to approve just any 155,000-foot concrete slab someplace without any clue as to who the person is that's going to be renting that? Because it's my opinion that the end user will affect uh, whatever goes on at a certain property. There's a difference between companies, the way they do business, and since uh, Mr. Conkey applauded fairly wildly for Walmart when it was mentioned before. I think it sort of opens up the floodgates for uh, talking to them. Uh, Walmart is kind of known for renegotiating their uh, sales tax and make deferments and, uh, you know, they negotiate for lower rates and things like that. It's also a county project, not a city project. Auburn's not going to see a lot of this money directly. It goes through a process before the sales tax gets uh, distributed to uh, Auburn area residents. Walmart's also known for abandoning their projects after a few years. They've left over 2 billion square feet of empty storefronts in the United States and Canada over the last uh, about five, six years. Uh, they're pretty well known for uh, hiring developers to uh, sort of backdoor their projects into different towns um, because they know there's going to be a lot of resistance just to the name Walmart and everything like that. So, and, uh, you know, they're is a reason that you guys exist and that there's a commission to discuss this kind of stuff, uh, to regulate property owners and developers, and, you know, to keep things from destroying a town's identity and personality. Auburn's got a lot of identity and personality, so a lot of us would like to, to keep it. Then if we uh, do have some more construction and uh, some more things built in town, things are going to support the town for a longer period of time than uh, some place like Walmart's known for. Uh, big box stores, I'm not too sure what the lifespan of some of the other companies are, but, uh, you know, it would be kind of nice to to have something to be around and uh, provide those jobs for more than just a couple of years. Everything sounds like a really nice uh, temporary amelioration to the, the city's problems right now, but uh, uh, a little bit of long-term planning, I think, is going to help out Auburn quite a bit. Uh, and the, those of us who just moved here for a few years ago are certainly going to appreciate it because we intend to stay unless something goes horribly awry around here. Uh, it just seems a, a little disingenuous to think that an end user on a project is not going to affect what happens to the town over the, the lifespan of the business. So. Also, it seems kind of strange to uh, not consider any future increase in air quality problems, traffic problems. Uh, you're sort of saying you can build a business, but we don't expect you to grow or be any bigger or better in Auburn. So uh, whoever you get in, I hope they're wildly successful. Hi, folks. 
Ben Hauser. My uh, great grandparents moved here in 1849. They homesteaded the property that you're talking about. I think this is the greatest thing come along since the wagon. <laughs> And they uh, also donated the property for the highway, straight through the middle of their property. So if it's not wide enough, I'm so bummed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it's really great. And I used to ride my bicycle down in the middle of 49. And if uh, we hadn't had the influx of Everybody from L.A., I could still do that. Thank you. This isn't quite my cup of tea, but I am just, this man has, I'm Doreen Ashby, and I've lived here for 40 years. And this man has a uh, property that was, that is designated for building uh, his business. And it is a free country, I thought. And everybody seems to think that they have the right to tell him how he is, what he's supposed to build, what he, kind of a business he's supposed to put on his property, and I think this is what is happening to our country, is the fact that too many people are deciding what we should do about our businesses, our lives. We need to step aside, and he's got his permits, he's got, has had his approvals, he's jumped through all the hoops, it's time to step aside and let him do his business. It's time for us to just step aside. We have done environmental. I have had a small business myself, and I jumped through all the hoops. I did everything I was supposed to do, and I ended up, and it was a child care center. And it was supposed to be a center. I went to college, I bought a house, I bought everything, I did everything I was supposed to do. And after everything I did, the neighbors came knocking on my door and said, we decided we don't want a child care center. And I said, you're going to have a child, a large family home child care. Because you can't go to the council and tell me I can't have one. So, 14, they could have had a lot more uh, restrictions on me if I'd had a center. And I have the best child care in the entire county. But they could have had more service to this county if they had just stepped aside. And that's all I have to say. Hello, my name is Kevin Sorensen. Um, born and raised here, and I'd kind of like to speak on behalf of a lot of people that aren't able to make it due to the time and <laughs> date. Anyhow, um, I was probably about four or five when I remember the Kmart shopping center going up. Shortly after that was Bel Air and so on, over to the Safeway, the Target. Just kind of keeps going up. The last one was the Walgreens, I think. I'm not sure why we keep putting a store that sells the same thing next to another store that sells the same thing next to another store. I understand, you know, it's nice to have it, but convenience isn't, I don't know, it, it, it comes at a price. And 
if you haven't driven up and down 49 and been stuck in traffic, <coughs> I don't know how somebody can say that this is not going to affect the traffic on 49. Every single day that I drive between Atwood and Luther, I get stopped at every single stoplight, sometimes wait two or three times before I'm actually able to make it through that stoplight. I just, I don't believe that this is of any value to our community. Thank you. My name is Catherine Yu. I live in Old Town Auburn. And I just want to go on the record as saying that I oppose this project. Um, I worked with people years ago fighting the other proposed Walmart. Um, the size and scope is inappropriate. Uh, 155,000 square feet in a fueling station um, is really not the appropriate project. Uh, I think that you should consider uh, the alternatives. And also, if you've done any reading on Walmart, which I'm fairly certain this is what it's going to be. Walmart is a predator re retailer, and after the construction jobs have finished, we will start losing our small business retails stores that are near this project. Um, it, it is not a good competitor for our businesses in this community. So again, I just want to say I oppose this project. I'm John Blodger. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of the area. I grew up in Auburn and been living in Meta Vista for the last 40 years. I must confess I haven't been following this very close because I couldn't figure out where they were going to put this store. So finally today I came to your meeting and this is insane. That's all I can say. <laughs> this, this is four acres. It looks like a four acre store stuffed in the middle of a subdivision connected to the road by an overly over overcrowded road already. And I don't understand why this is even being considered. Uh, the negative aspects of Walmart, pe other people have discussed, and, and I think that is wor worthy of consideration. But this is just being jammed into a subdivision. And I grew up in Auburn, and the quality of life I enjoyed was really special in the 40s and 50s. And it's changed. But still, there, there is a quality and, a, and a, a lifestyle here that we all still can enjoy. And many people have moved here for that lifestyle. They didn't move here for Walmart. And I think it's your obligation is to ensure that a developer can develop his developments, but it's also your obligation to ensure that the community and the people can still enjoy this environment after the developer is gone. So I urge you to not support this. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Doug Donio. I'm from uh, Woodside Village, also a member of PACE. I request that my time be given to uh, Mr. Finney. Okay, he had requested that he give his time to his attorney who's representing a large number of people, and so we'll, we'll go ahead and grant that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, members of the Commission, Mr. Planning Director, the staff, and the esteemed Mr. Finley, County Council. I'm pleased to be here today. My name is Tal Finney, and I do represent the APACE group. I have um, a letter I'd like to submit to the clerk, which will basically uh, kind of guide the comments I make today, if I could do that real quick. Okay, um, CEQA, the Environmental Quality Act, California Environmental Quality Act, the purpose of an EIR is to disclose and evaluate the potential physical environmental impacts resulting from construction and operation of a proposed project and subsequently identify and describe feasible mitigation measures and alternatives to avoid or reduce those impacts. An EIR must include details sufficient to enable those who did not participate in its preparation to understand and to consider meaningfully the issues raised uh, by the proposed project. Thus, the emission of relevant information can preclude informed decision-making and informed public participation regardless of whether a different outcome would have resulted if the public agency had complied with the disclosure requirements. Um, a number of 
<clears throat> issues came to our attention in reviewing the, com the draft EIRs, the comments, and the final EIR EIRs proposed, and I'm just going to run through those very briefly. The EIRs alternatives chapter concludes that under the no canal street alternative, the additional impacted intersection is Luther Road and State Route 49. The proposed mitigation measure for that impacted intersection is to signalize a different intersection, Luther Road and Canal Street. No analysis is provided to explain how this is a suitable mitigation measure for this significant impact. The EIR must explain the causal relationship between this mitigation measure and the reduction of impacts at Luther Road and State Route 49 to acceptable levels. Further, the analysis of signalizing Luther Road and Canal Street consistently fails to address public concerns and the real world impacts regarding traffic impacts on the entrance to the Woodside Village Mobile Home Park, whose access point is less than 300 feet from the impacted intersection. This, since this mitigation measure does not appear to address the traffic impacts of the No Canal Street alternative and instead creates collateral traffic impacts for adjacent residents, these concerns must be addressed in the EIR. California law mandates that an adequate EIR must respond to specific suggestions for mitigating a significant environmental impact unless the suggested mitigation is facially feasible. In addition, the traffic analysis of the No Canal Street alternative fails to consider the effects of funneling traffic to the project's one access point the primary access on traffic routes to the project and the resulting highway impacts, arterial road impacts, and lane queuing impacts. Because Luther connects to I-80 via Bowman, the presence of this large development will likely transform Luther Road from a residential collector or artery to a commercial artery. The EIR's failure to thoroughly evaluate the scope of traffic impacts created by the project, including effects on adjacent residential neighborhoods and a higher volume of freeway traffic from I-80 is evidenced by its failure to proper analyze supercenters. Supercenters, uh, which several of the uh, potential retail establishments and their associated ilk qualify as, uh, draw from a regional, larger regional market than more typical shopping centers with the same total square footage of retail space and have unique traffic impacts. The EIR failed to consider that since the project is located in the greater Sacramento area, with I-80 as the largest thoroughfare, traffic will approach the project from outside the study area. Further, traffic analysis is required for project impacts on the I-80 and State Route 49 intersection, additional I-80 off-ramps, and additional intersections between I-80 and the project site that will experience heavier traffic. Additional mitigation measures, such as the additional signalization and speed humps, may be needed to regulate traffic approaching the project site from I-80 and to reduce noise and traffic impacts on the residential areas. Uh, the analysis further does not explain how the TRIPS data is converted to an LOS analysis. It is not clear how many extra TRIPS cause a particular intersection to drop from LOS D to E. What the impact is of the long curving single lane roadway between State Route 49 and the proposed project's parking lot and what factors, if any, contribute to LOS analysis. The IRS further, sorry, the EIR uh, further fails to provide a meaningful analysis of air quality impacts expected under the no canal street alternative. It failed to meet the most basic standard of providing information to enable the public and the decision makers to evaluate the known physical environmental impacts of this project. The final EIR clearly states that, quote, implementation of the project will result in significant impacts in regard to air quality, unquote. Quote, because the under no canal street alternative is proposed to increase traffic congestion at the primary axis and CO emissions are directly related to traffic congestion, the under no canal street alternative would have greater impacts as compared to the proposed project and more air pollutants would be emitted, end quote. <clears throat> Neither the draft EIR alternatives, chapter 17, nor the air quality analysis chapter, chapter 9, provides any data regarding this alternative's increase in pollutants or analysis regarding the greater air quality impacts. The public and the reviewing body lacks any data to assess the increased air quality operational impacts of the No Canal Street alternative on study area intersections, impacts on nearby sensitive receptors in residential neighborhoods, or potential mitigation measures. There is no way to assess the extent to which the No Canal Street alternative negatively impacts air quality because no data has been provided. Uh, this lack of information fails to meet CEQA informational threshold. In addition, the final EIR's enhanced analysis of the No Canal Street alternative failed to provide any data regarding the increased air quality impacts, yet somehow concluded that the impacts would be less significant. I also want to point out that uh, I've had the good honor to represent one of your neighboring counties on naturally occurring asbestos issues and have been the lead attorney on the uh, local government side in uh, the struggle with federal regulators to impose 
very stringent regulatory requirements on communities that have great exposure to naturally occurring asbestos and serpentine rock. And uh, I did want to point out, I know that the NOAA issue has been raised on the public record. I wanted to heighten the concern that's raised by that because having reviewed the site maps, uh, you are sitting directly on top of a major uh, serpentine rock uh, formation, and that's of great significance and concern to the community as well. Uh, I want to quickly discuss the deficient socioeconomic or urban decay analysis. The response to comment letter number three indicates that the ERA adjusted its data to reflect 2010 information, but that adjustment was made only for the population growth. No economic adjustments were made. The ERA relied on pre-recession data, though it is intended to provide a comprehensive analysis, comprehensive analysis of the regional economic impact of the project. In addition to failing to update its information, the ERA did not include complete data regarding the length of the recession. It is critical to recognize that ERA prepared its report during the effects of the recession, a very significant one, but did not collect or cite to any data from the beginning of the recession from September 2008 to present. Thus, their conclusion that retail in the Auburn region is performed relatively well despite the recession is highly suspect at best because this myopic conclusion is based on only a fraction of the relevant data. The ERA also relied on outdated assumptions to conclude that medium incomes are rising in Placer County and it is economically irresponsible to claim that a linear growth in an income based on data from the robust growth, growth of the 1990s and the housing bubble of the 2000s would be accurate and applicable today. Uh, retail trade area inexplic inexplicably includes large areas of central and northeast Placer County. This misrepresents the population centers and areas of retail demand for Placer County that are currently growing. By focusing the retail trade area on lower population areas with less existing retail establishments and less retail demand, the urban decay data regarding existing and projected retail supply and demand is skewed and the urban decay effects of the project is minimized. This also conveniently created a project retail trade area that artificially excluded existing and planned retail developments such as a super center in the Loomis area that will compete with the project. The EIR's socioeconomic analysis created a skewed retail trade area by misrepresenting the reality of Sacramento's influence, the existing population along I-80, and the actual population centers in Placer County. Also, the EIR, EIR failed to analyze concerns regarding competition with existing and proposed retailers in the retail trade area, and inappropriately relied on data to make the unfounded conclusion that the project would not result in significant urban decay impacts. The IR failed to assess the grave urban decay impacts of supercenters. Uh, it should address the unique urban decay impacts of a supercenter due to the likelihood that the project will operate as a supercenter with extended commercial operating hours. Uh, and they're also known under the law to raise unique and additional environmental impacts. Uh, the EIR's urban decay analysis should factor in the blemished record of supercenters, uh, such as some of the companies named today, regarding their contributions to urban decay and the need for mitigation measures. Um, to wrap up here, it failed to analyze cumulative impacts of the No Canal Street alternative. Uh, concedes that the No Canal Street alternative would lead to greater traffic and air quality impacts at the primary axis than the proposed project. However, the cumulative analysis did not study the No Canal Street alternative. It did not properly analyze the impact of supercenters again, which draw from a larger regional market. Uh, that provided no data regarding which intersections the mixed use alternative will impact. Though the number of impacted intersections is disclosed, the data bears no relevance to the nature and extent of their impact on traffic and circulation and deprives the public of an understanding of the effects of this alternative on traffic and circulation in their community. The EIR fails to analyze the impact of the mixed-use alternative on the Luther Road and Canal Street intersection, which is proposed to be signalized in conjunction with the project. Since this is a major mitigation measure proposed for the project and will have severe and lasting impacts on traffic and circulation in the surrounding residential neighborhoods, the public is entitled to know whether this alternative would also necess necessitate a mitigation measure. Uh, finally, as is evident from the comments on the draft EIR, there is significant controversy over the visual impacts of the project to the neighboring community, which we've heard today, a noise that will be generated by delivery trucks at the project, the proposing, proposal of a six to eight foot sound wall to be constructed along Canal Street is uh, acknowledged as a mitigation measure, but could be deficient. However, the EIR ignores a project alternative that would mitigate these concerns and was mentioned in at least one draft EIR comment devoting part of the project footprint to green space. This project alternative was raised in comment letter number 10, uh, and the responses to that comment completely ignored it. So based on all of these reasons that I have cited, uh, the letter is more detailed and thorough, and I, I did previously serve as the OPR director of the state. And, um, was one of the two state officials that comments on CEQA and issued the general plan guidelines for counties and chaired the local government partnership for the governor of California. 
which is uh, basically where the uh, state executive branch interfaces with all the local uh, county municipal uh, entities, as well as special districts, LAFCOs, et cetera. I respectfully, on behalf of my client, uh, state that the Bohemia ER fails to adequately identify and evaluate the potential environmental impacts of the project and the No Canal Street alternative for reasons including but not limited to those that I've addressed. And because of this, the IRA fails as an informational document and thus precludes complete and informed decision making and informed public participation. We therefore respectfully request that the Placer County Planning Commission not approve this final EIR. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thirty-four ten Sunshine Way. Thank you for turning on the microphone. I led the last battle against Bohemia Walmart, won in court in late 1990s. Jim Conkey and Walmart lost that lawsuit because of the appalling economic damage of Walmart to the city of Auburn. Nothing has changed. Then county staff consistently said the economic impacts were not part of the review process required by CEQA and therefore did not need to be looked at, period. However, the court ruled against Conkey and County and told Conkey to reopen the case. For over five years, he wavered, did nothing. Finally, he opted not to go further, and the suit was at last settled by Conkey and Walmart, both paying attorney's fees to our side. I was there. In CEQA cases, the loser pays attorney's fees and other costs. Jim Conkey lost that battle, and this corrects his false statement in the Auburn Journal letter of May 2010. The double cases in Bakersfield in which I participated on the legal team were won in December 13, 2004. In cases F044943 and F045035, the Bakersfield Citizens for Local Control Plaintiff and Appellant gained a resounding victory in the California 5th District Court of Appeal. Quote, the inaccuracy in some case law results from the fact that environmental review is not supposed to be segregated from project approval. The judgments are reserved and the actions are remanded to the Superior Court of Kern County. BCLC is awarded its statutory costs in both actions. <coughs> C&C is to pay the entirety of the cost award in the Gosford action. P99 is to pay the entirety of the cost awarded in the Panama action. BCLC's request for judicial notice, and all attorneys will understand the value of this, is granted. Upon remand, the Superior Court is directed in both actions to issue new writs of mandate, ordering the city to void its certification of the EIRs and findings of overriding considerations and to void its approval of the projects and associated zoning changes, general plan amendments, and other resulted um, and related land use entitlements. The nearly completed coal store in that complex was ordered to be destroyed. Gentlemen of the Planning Commission, I could go on for hours on these issues, but the same fate awaits this Auburn plan as did the previous one and those in Bakersfield. Bohemia will fail again in court. Go ahead, approve this project. You'll make my day, my next five years plus of good days. But I ask you not to ignore Doug Conley's Auburn Journal letter of 7510. It is part of my administrative record testimony and included here. Thank you for your attention. I meet your deadline, sir. Thank you. I'm Carol Arbe and respectfully requesting the answer to my questions. Get my microphone. There we go. Okay. We'll take that up after all the public input. And when we come back to staff and, and address all the things that have come up cumulatively. Mm. Will I learn that Carol. before I leave here today? I don't know when you're leaving. Well, I, mean, I think it's very important for the public to be aware of the cost to the public. And so before this is approved or hopefully disapproved, I think this should be also be made aware. I think that's transparency. Thank you. I, I will try to get you answers. Is there anybody else that wants to address the commission? Yes, thank you. My name is Jay Cooper, a uh, longtime resident of Auburn. Uh, I was here when 
49 was a two-lane road. Uh, the um, Bel Air or Rayleigh's was Yamasaki's nursery. Um, first off, what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank everybody here as far as this process. This is just fantastic to see. Ladies and gentlemen that have to make this decision, this is a very, very difficult decision, and I hope everybody appreciates that fact. Uh, you're going to make it based upon law. You're going to make it based upon the general plan for the Highway 49 Bowman Corridor. And you're going to make it based upon what's best for Auburn. Now, whose side am I on? I'm not on anybody's side. I have a business that is straight across the street, Auburn Honda, that I developed uh, starting in the year about 1999. My process to get permits took three years. At that point, I was, I was very upset. I felt that my property rights were abused for the, uh, the time and the energy and the cost that it took to do this. So yes, I do have some empathy for Mr. Conkey. Being across the street with an automotive business, whatever goes in there, from what I understand, will have automotive retail. They'll have tires, they'll have automotive parts, they'll have service. So yes, that'll affect my business. I have a personal opinion of that. I'm going to keep that to myself. I have empathy for the people that live around it. What I don't have empathy for, again, for one thing, are attorneys. This should be something that should be decided by the Auburn people and our process. I am so tired about everybody running to an attorney to fight their issue regardless of what the, the best, the overall result for this community is. So I just, I just ask everybody in this community to support the people that have to make this decision to bring them information and come together as a community. That's what we're all about. Thank you. Good morning, still. I have to follow up with this gentleman here and everything that's been going on. Uh, Dan Crenshaw is my name, and this is what is bothering me. This is the first time I've been here, but it bothers me that this thing is so out of proportion. It's nothing but a big box. It's like a, it's like a little town, and you're pushing this town into Auburn, which Auburn was based on small businesses when it first started out. Little stores, little stores, little stores. That's the way it's always been. And now you're pushing a big box that has 15, 10 to 15 businesses in it. You got your shoes and socks, you got your tires, you got your stationery, you got grocery, you got this, you got that. That is a small town you're looking at right there, and you're trying to push it in Auburn. I'm sorry. Is there anybody else wants to come up? <clears throat> My name is Byron Wilson. I don't represent anybody but myself. <clears throat> I'm not an attorney, and uh, I can't resist the thought <clears throat> that we ought not be intimidated by attorneys, and lest this one over here tell us we ought to be. And it ought to be <clears throat> decided on the merits of the case, applying some correct principles. We, that flag, liberty and justice for all. Well, this is not a lynching mob, but the property owner has some rights too. It's ironic that this is the, we the very week that we celebrate Independence Day. 
And I think that embodies freedom of choice to the maximum possible, recognizing there are irritations. And I'm glad the founding fathers didn't have to have an EIR before they came here. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm a shopper. I will choose where I shop. That's my business. I don't live in Auburn. I live up the hill. Once I get in my car, if I don't have a destination place, or what I call a magnet to pull me off that freeway, I go right on down. And the satellites follow the magnets. The satellites are the smaller ones. You have a big uh, magnet, and it will pull the, f the smaller ones along with you. And I'm, I guess I'm, I'm in support of this. I think uh, it'll be good for Auburn. It'll be good for me. And if I spend money here that's going to be good for the taxpayers of this community. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Ian Aiken, and I live on Oak Ridge Way, which is a subdivision above Fiddler Green, one of the oldest ones in North Auburn. I'm concerned about uh, the ingress, egress, and the traffic flow that's going to be in and out of this place. And we'll start with the parking lot. If I recall, it was going to be a 500 car space slot. If it was only half full, uh, I don't see how you're going to get anybody coming out that uh, curvature and then down to a single left turn lane when you have a lot of double turn left turn, turn lanes, such as Nevada Street, Bell Road, and Dry Creek. Next concern I have is uh, the proposal of a, a stoplight on uh, Canal and Luther, which is at the base of a, of a observation is very poor westbound. Uh, the answer to the county then was to put in three stop signs uh, on Luther Road to try to slow the traffic. Traffic's going to increase on Luther Road. Oak Ridge is an offset uh, intersection to Derry Road, and uh, we have had, we're getting up to about three to five minutes right now. We're getting people out of Fiddler Green that come on up and come on out on to Oak Ridge Way. This possibility now will, it was in front of this commission back when we opened Princeton Club Estates. They wanted to put, divert some traffic off of 49 by running it up Oak Ridge and all the way down through there and underneath the railroad tracks and on out to Bell Road. I see this possibility coming up again said, well, we got a fire lane in there now, and that's due to the possibilities of a train accident and having people get out, which it was right to do. But I see that saying, being overridden sometimes, saying, well, now this is another way we can get things out. We can open up the canal, send them on up, uh, up to Oak Ridge and uh, send them north and on out to uh, Bell, uh, uh, New Airport Road and Bell Road. And I'm, I'm just seeing some problems here that, uh, that will be addressed, but unfortunately, ap after the fact. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Is there anybody else that would like to address the commission? Was there anybody out in the hallway that's coming running in? I don't want to leave anybody out. It's quiet. OK. That's the case, then I will, Jim. Uh, we're prepared to do the applicant's rebuttal. I don't know if you are going to ask for that separately or if not. Actually, what I was going to do was go back to staff first, and then we'll give you a chance to chime in. We always give you a chance to, to weigh in. I, I had a funny feeling that as the attorney, you'd want to respond. So I'm cutting off the public input at this point. Uh, Jerry, do you have anything to add? We do have some questions pending that you may want to comment on, or do you want to defer to the applicant first? Uh, I think we could defer to the applicant. I'm sure we have lots of information to share if it's warranted. So, okay. Jim, you're on then. 
Good afternoon. It's now 12.02. Uh, Jim Moose on behalf of the applicant. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the Commission, to, uh, to offer some thoughts and rebuttal. I want to start out by saying that uh, we appreciate everything that everyone has had to say. I uh, have represented a lot of applicants over the years, and sometimes uh, there's hard-hitting testimony uh, against projects, but I always uh, say this is America, and the great thing about America is people can say whatever they want, and uh, you don't always have to agree with what people say, and, and people come and, and express their views with passion, and we respect all that. So what I'd like to try to do in the time I have now is just sort of put it all in context as, as we see it. And I want to start out by talking about what I think is the nature of the decision uh, before the Commission, and I think the Commissioners understand that based on some remarks I heard at the outset, but so I'm, I'm talking uh, in large part to, to the assembled uh, folks here. Uh, this, of course, is a, a land use decision, and you are a local government entity, and we live in a country where we have a federal government and a state government, as well as local governments, and each level of government has its own duties. Uh, there are people who criticize uh, Walmart, uh, who is not a firm tenant, regardless of what some people think, it's a possible tenant. Uh, and they, they question things like uh, working conditions and, and all sorts of other things. My respectful uh, reaction to those sorts of sentiments when they're expressed in, in, in this context is if you have a complaint about something like that, you shouldn't direct it to a local government land use body, but rather to some other uh, department of the state or federal government perhaps if you think that a particular corporation is, is doing something that's unlawful. Really, the, the, the nature of the decision here is whether the particular use uh, is appropriate uh, given the, the general plan designation, the community plan designation, the policies in those documents, the zoning, and the information you have uh, from the environmental impact report. Uh, we've heard a lot of testimony suggesting that uh, people uh, have a right to know or need to know who the uh, ultimate tenant is before a land use is approved, but that's, that's simply uh, contrary to the, uh, the longstanding uh, principles governing these sorts of decisions. Sometimes you do know, sometimes uh, you don't. Uh, but local government traditionally has not been uh, uh, thought to have the power to discriminate amongst particular businesses who might engage in a particular land use. In other words, it's not for a local government body to say, I like this company, I don't like that company. That would be interfering with, uh, with the marketplace. It's completely legitimate, of course, to say, uh, we're going to limit your, your activities within reasonable bounds based on a desire to, uh, to limit impacts, to mitigate impacts. But it's not, it's not appropriate, with all respect, for a uh, county planning commission or a county board of supervisors or city council or a city planning commission to say, we don't want this particular business doing business in our community. We think they're a bad actor. To the extent that any hypothetical company might be engaged in things they shouldn't that are unlawful. As I said, there's, there's levels of government uh, to which people can direct uh, thoughts on those, on those points. I think we assume any tenant here in the future is going to live within the rules that you all lay out in terms of conditions of approval and mitigation measures. Now, um, Mr. Smith mentioned a, uh, a Court of Appeal decision from several years ago, the so-called uh, Bakerfield Citizens uh, case which did will deal with uh, environmental impacts of a Walmart supercenter, or actually two that were proposed down in, in Bakersfield uh, running on parallel tracks. That case does not stand for the proposition that uh, it's relevant that it is a Walmart coming into a community as much as it stands for the proposition that if you have a supercenter as a use, that you should analyze that as a different kind of use perhaps than the, a more old-fashioned smaller department store. And it's true that a super center does draw on a larger area, uh, and it therefore has uh, impacts that might differ somewhat in kind from, from a, a smaller department store. My reading of the EIR here is that those impacts have been analyzed. Uh, the approach here, because Mr. Conkey doesn't have a tenant, was to assume a, a hypothetical Costco-like tenant and a hypothetical Walmart-like superstore, and to look at the impacts that would occur under uh, both scenarios. And we believe that those impacts have been adequately uh, revealed. Now, it's important, I, I'd suggest, to, to understand in this context that when we're looking at the environmental impacts of projects and environmental impact reports, that it's, it's not necessarily appropriate to, to conclude that because a particular 
land use or a particular hypothetical tenant might be competitive in the marketplace, that that's a bad thing per se and that the government ought to interfere in the rough and tumble of competition out there. Uh, traditionally in this country, we've had what the U.S. Supreme Court has called a national common market, whereby we're all part of one economic unit in this country, at least after the Articles of Confederation were eliminated back in the 1780s. And if a, a company comes in from out of town and they give the consumers what they want and they're willing to play by the rules that the local government imposes, then uh, we can't keep them out even if uh, some local uh, business might not uh, appreciate having the competition. Consumers benefit from this. And the success of Walmart as a corporation, whatever people think about it, uh, reflects that people vote with their wallets. And people go and, and shop at these uh, super centers because they find their, the things they want at prices they, f they think are, are better than where, where, what they can find somewhere else. Now what CEQA over the last 10 years or so has, has uh, uh, required is that where there are economic issues or economic impacts associated with the project that will foreseeably culminate in physical impacts, that brings it back within the ambit of CEQA. CEQA is concerned with environmental impacts and any environmental impact that is reasonably foreseeable is within the ambit of, of an EIR. So you can have an, an adverse economic impact which in turn could lead to adverse physical changes and if those adverse physical changes amount to significant effects on the environment, then those can be the subject of the requirement under CEQA that feasible mitigation measures uh, be imposed. Uh, I've been involved in a, in a lot of these uh, disputes over the years, never representing Walmart, but representing developers who, who have uh, had Walmarts uh, as part of their projects. So I've been through these wars uh, quite a bit. And what's uh, developed in the environmental consultant profession and the economics profession over the last decade or so is a, a manner uh, in which these uh, potential physical effects are addressed. The concept the courts talk about is urban decay. And so what happens typically and what has happened here, and I think it was done well, was to do an economic study to identify uh, businesses that might uh, uh, be in competition with a new land use and to project how uh, the pie might be uh, recut up. A lot of times with the uh, anticipated population growth in an area, uh, there's a rising tide that will lift all boats and a newcomer can uh, take a piece of the market and the market grows and no one's put out of business, no urban decay results. Obviously in, in recent times there's less uh, robust uh, economic growth and, and population growth. But still, I think the, uh, the long-term outlook for Placer County is probably as good as it is uh, anywhere that I know in this country. But e even so, what, what the economic study here showed was that there would be some economic fallout. But then the, the important question under CEQA was asked, will that competition and will uh, any of the people who lose business under, under a uh, scenario where there is a super center, for example, will that result in urban decay? And the ultimate question for a court, if a court were to look at this, would be whether substantial evidence supports the conclusion in this EIR that notwithstanding some economic impacts, which in this country we typically think are a good thing because it reflects competition, benefits consumers, whether there's substantial evidence to support the conclusion that there will be no urban decay. Uh, from what I've seen, this is a very technical issue. Courts are inclined to defer to the expertise of economists and, and consultants there is abundant substantial evidence to support the notion that this project will not result in physical significant effects on the environment in, in the form of urban decay. Uh, small businesses might prefer not to have competition. I'm in a law firm. Uh, I just do not have too much competition, but I understand <laughs> that I, I don't get that wish. And I also understand that uh, society as a whole is, is better off if I have competition because I won't be able to charge my clients quite as much uh, if I have more of an oligopoly sort of uh, share of the market. Uh, so I wanted to sort of just for everyone's benefit try to put this in context. Uh, people have passionate views about Walmart. I tend to think of them as uh, a pretty effective corporation in giving people what they want. Uh, they, they've made some mistakes in the past. They're, they're I think, trying to react and uh, uh, they're more green than they used to be and uh, they, they're sensitive to the criticism. I learned this working with their attorneys over the years. But I don't think any of that really is, is uh, relevant to the decision at hand. Uh, I also want to say that uh, I think you have discretion to, uh, to approve the project as proposed. 
Uh, a lady uh, earlier this morning suggested that uh, because the mixed use alternative was environmentally superior to use the CEQA terminology to the project as proposed, uh, that you are obligated to, to approve that mixed use alternative and to reject the project. I'd like to respectfully disagree with that. Uh, the draft findings that have been, been prepared for you uh, by staff with uh, oversight by Mr. Uh, Finlay uh, articulate reasons why the uh, commission can reject as infeasible, as CEQA defines that term, that mixed use alternative. And essentially what CEQA allows in this context is uh, for a decision making body to engage in what the courts call a reasonable balancing of competing economic, social and environmental considerations. You can look at the project objectives, the purposes of, uh, behind the project and determine that if it, the proposal uh, made by the developer uh, is more successful in meeting objectives like improving the fiscal situation in the county or providing more jobs than is, for example, here, the mixed use alternative that is within your uh, discretion to uh, approve the project as proposed. I think the findings that have uh, been put before you are, are supportable and would be, uh, would be upheld by a court, that's my opinion. Now, I, I confess that uh, when, when Mr. Finney uh, handed out his letter and was reading from it, that I uh, was unable to completely absorb all of it in uh, sufficient time to get up uh, right now, 10 minutes later, and say that I fully have analyzed it and can say with, with certainty that there's no merit to any of it. Uh, in fact, what I would intend to do uh, w with uh, more time would be to study it very carefully. I can say, though, that what I think I heard and what I think I saw as I glanced through the letter was primarily what I would call technical arguments. Uh, I make a distinction here between factual issues and uh, legal issues. It's a, a relevant distinction in, in uh, court proceedings. And, and it's relevant because if, if issues are technical and factual in nature, uh, courts tend to look at them with more deference to the public agency than they do on pure questions of law. Courts will say, we know what the law is. You might have an opinion about what a statute means, uh, Mr. Planning Commissioner, but I'm a judge and I, in the, our system of government, get to make the decision what the law is. On the other hand, courts are humble enough to know that they're not traffic engineers, they're not biologists, they're not uh, urban decay specialists or economists. And so when courts review EIRs, and they see disputes over the adequacy of, say, an air quality uh, discussion, the modeling done, the, the techniques used by traffic engineers, the techniques used by economists. They're very inclined to say, we're going to go with uh, the determinations made by the public agency, provided that they're supported by substantial evidence, because it is up to the public agency to determine which of a set of experts on these technical issues it finds most persuasive. So what happens commonly in these situations is the county has a contract with a very reputable environmental consultant like Rainey uh, Management. It brings a team of, of people to, to bear on the preparation of an EIR, people with specializations touching all, all the disciplines. They, without any loyalty to the applicant uh, because of the contractual uh, relationship with the county, will call it as they see it. And, that, and there's expert judgment behind that. So. Uh, I believe that we have substantial evidence supporting all these technical determinations. It's also very common to have uh, people come up and uh, challenge some of those uh, technical determinations. Uh, and courts, as I say, will, uh, will tend to side with, with the agency, except in the limited situation of a negative declaration where the, the uh, tie goes to the opponents if they have a fair argument that there may be a significant effect on the environment. Now, I, I do intend to study Mr. Finney's uh, musings uh, with great care. I hope after you've approved the project, and I'm anticipating, I think, at this point, an appeal. Uh, if I were a betting man, I would, I would uh, guess that's a, a possibility. And under that scenario, I'm, I'm very confident that Mr. Finley will, will review this very carefully. I, of course, uh, will do so on behalf of uh, my own client. And in all candor, if I see problems that I'm unaware of now, I would advise uh, my client, and, and I'm sure this is what Mr. Finley would advise the Board of Supervisors, that if this document is not ready to defend in court, uh, we would need to do what we would need to do to make it, uh, make it so worthy. There's no uh, benefit to, to uh, getting into years of litigation uh, on a document that's not likely to be sustained. 
as I stand here right now, I don't have any reason to believe this document can't be sustained. So what I would respectfully suggest would be that uh, after you hear from staff, and particularly for, for Mr. Finley, he, he might disagree with me on this, that you would uh, go ahead and, and take action on the project uh, with the belief and expectation that uh, it's not over yet, that the Board of Supervisors uh, may see this project, and that in the time available between your action and the Board's action, uh, the county staff, uh, Mr. Finley, uh, the consultants, uh, and others will all review very carefully what Mr. Finney has had, had to say. And if he has, if he's pointed out some things that are wrong, then we'll, we'll try to deal with them. Uh, so unless you have any questions, it's, that's all I have for you. Any questions for, for Jim? I guess not. Thank you very much. Jim Conkey, Roseville, California. I, I do have some comments uh, uh, briefly. Um, one of them is everything Dale Smith said. I disagree with almost everything I disagree with and refute. Um, sounds like the neighbors have decided they want to reopen Canal Street uh, because the closure has caused them any problems. So that's always an issue we're going to look at when it goes to the board. Um, I think um, the only other thing would be the three conditions that Mr. Keyes brought up. Now that time frame, 6 a.m. to 12, is, is pretty standard all over. It's what these tenants have and want as times for delivery and operation. It's mitigated. That there's, the noise study shows that there's no impacts from that. And I would respectfully request that we keep that just the way it is. And that's not unusual. It's done many, many times on many projects I've had and others. It's, it's not unusual. Um, as to the oak tree, yes, I wanted to save that oak tree beyond belief, but it just didn't work out. So I, I'm planting hundreds and hundreds of trees to take its place. Okay? And if there was ever a chance to change this and make that happen, then that's something I would do. I just wanted them to know that. Um, Mr. Keyes, are you still here? Did you have another condition? It was the graffiti on, oh. on the wall. Yes, uh, that's something that we would normally do. One, it's screened and it's, it's fast growing and it's massive amounts of, of landscaping. So you, you have a six to eight foot sound wall. You're gonna have massive amounts of landscaping. Somebody complained about the landscaping that it's too much. I, you know, I just can't seem to make everybody happy. Um, this, this will screen it quickly within five years. Uh, you're not going to see the project. You can't hear it. The lighting study, uh, we, we designed this so that no light escapes the property. And as far as the housing, um, this property is actually surrounded 75% by commercial railroad tracks and industrial property. It's not this, this single-family home subdivision that these people keep talking about. You have eight homes that actually back up to the building. You've got two that actually back up to the railroad tracks. In a, in a vacant part of open space that we have in our property. That's a total of 10 homes. We've moved that property as far to PG&E side as we could, and we moved it forward as much as we could, and then we have between the buildings over 170 feet of buffer, and then you have Canal Street up there, and you have over 170 feet of buffer before you even get to a, another house. So, um, so I just wanted to get that right. Uh, and the bottom line is this property was actually, in, and Jerry Haas can speak to this, has been zoned. That zoning does, uh, was in place in 1987 when I bought it. It was in place in 1984 and actually was in place well before that, not the zoning at the Auburn Bowman Community Plan, which is just commercial. But the other one I did allow, and there's documentation of that beyond belief, commercial retail. Uh, does that go back to 1963, Jerry? It does. Yeah, right. it goes all the way back to 1963. This could have been developed as a, a retail property. Um, my last comment is a lot of people say this is just too big. Well, it's probably, it's easily the most efficient design any architect or engineer, engineer can tell you that. It's also the su most superior environmental type development. Yet you use a lot less water. You, it's a lot less energy to heat or cool, and it's a lot less sewer compact versus six or seven buildings with all these uses spread out. It's far more efficient in materials and uses, 
It's, it's the absolute premium type development if you were going just on those aspects. If you're going, say, for looks, maybe it's not number one, but we've mitigated a, a lot of that in which you can't hardly see. The, I disagree. You can't see this property with the walls and the landscaping. You've got to go over there and try to look at it, or you've got to drive under the property or walk on it. Now, I don't know what else I can do. I think um, what I've heard here today has not changed my mind one bit. I mean, these, this is the, the project. This works. It's way more efficient than splitting it up and running it all over the place. It, this is what works. This is, there's very few people in the economy that are willing to expand. And these, this is the type, this is the Costco site plan. This is what they want to go. And there, small businesses are going out. Small businesses depend on these. As a couple people said, the people in Auburn Plaza have, are praying that this gets approved. This brings people to this shopping center. And the small businesses can um, be a lot more successful with this type of use, because right now they're dying on the vine. The owners of the Auburn Plaza, I talked to them, they have leases up to 40% of additional space will be signed when this project is, project is approved by small businesses. So they're not running away, they're coming to it. And if small businesses are so afraid of this, where are they? You know, how many did show up? Hundreds, scores of them? No, because they're not afraid. They want to be near it. So anyway, thank you. Uh, 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 Jim? Rich, Rich has a question for you. Yeah. Okay, maybe these are a couple small points. Sure. Um, let me see. We, somewhere in the documentation, I read that there's going to be some undergrounding of power lines. Are those lines the ones that are on Canal Street that are going to be undergrounded? Um, that's this, news. this is with reference to the vegetation you're planting growing up under the power lines. Type question. Uh, well, I think that's more of a maintenance issue where we would trim it and, and keep it from from going higher, that, that would be that approach. And you have to get, it's PG&E's power lines, and I really don't think it's an issue of any type. And we're not undergrounding any power lines. Oh, okay, so I guess. No, that's... zero. Um, but we will maintain that landscaping so it doesn't reach any kind of a, there's a, a certain height that can't go beyond that pg and is gonna monitor, and we'll monitor it with them. We'll have that kind of a landscape plan. That's how we handle it. Okay. And that's, a, a lot of the issues are handled that way. Okay. Thank you. You see, there was also, uh, oh. uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, I've read in, in the material that a lot of people are concerned about uh, the people come to this store and then using the park across the street. But also I saw reference to an a outdoor public use area that's going to be uh, put on the site. Maybe you can explain that or where that would be. It's, it's uh, well, do you want me to, uh, let me respond to the park. Now, the park is a private park. I have a hard time believing you have a public park down that people are going to go do that. But let's say they do. I mean, there are changes this brings. There's no doubt about it. And some of those have to be the responsibility of the people that, that have that park. My suggestion is you fence it and you put a lock on it. I mean, that's what I would do. That's what almost everyone else does. All of a sudden, it becomes our problem. That's what you should do if you have that concern for safety or whatever. That's, that's what normal people do, reasonable. Um, this is, well, yeah, you take responsibility. And, you know, same when you buy your home back up to almost 19 acres of vacant property. Uh, there, you know, every land you study from the redevelopment agency, the Auburn Bowman Community Plan, and the general plan, and the zoning all the way back to 63, you would have found out what possibly could go there. And maybe, I went to all, every land use hearing at the Auburn Bowman Community Plan. No one ever showed up to oppose the zoning. No one ever showed up to, to make any changes to it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a lot of people have to ask the realtor or whatever, you're buying property up against vacant land, you need to find out what's going to go there. That's not my responsibility. That's yours. And if you have an issue with it, show up to the Auburn Bowman Community Plan <clears throat> and tell them about it. Not here now, once I've come forward with a proposal, in a land use that's been allowed, zoned in, in the redevelopment agency, and again, every land use plan you can imagine. So and it's been in place for a long, long time. It's, it's not, now is not the time, and that's my biggest bother with this, is everybody shows up once you come up with something, not prior to. 
So, thank you. Well, yeah, I guess what was what I was questioning is uh, the uh, documents right. indicate there's an outdoor public use area that's going to have a picnic table or something in it. Um, part of this plan. It's it's like a, it's sort of like a. It's going to have a what one bench and a couple of. Yeah, it's similar to what you would see over uh, at the new Home Depot uh, back there on First Avenue. There's some benches and tables out there just for public use. Uh, within the landscaped areas somewhere on the site, there would be about 500 square feet of public use to allow people to kind of get out of the sun for a little bit. And, um, okay. It's a place to relax. You can have water or drinks and, you know, that type of thing. Um, I think it's pretty common in, in projects these days to have people do that. Versus, you know, there's no reason to go over to the park, I think, is the point. Uh, they can stay right there, eat it, and relax, it's shaded and et cetera. So. It would allow employees to take breaks outdoors. That right. Kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, we've, you know, a lot of time has gone into this beyond belief, years of study, of taking account of the neighbors and their concerns. And I have listened. I've taken account of it. We did close off Canal Street, which was the biggest thing they asked for. Now I'm hearing I'm a jerk for closing off Canal Street. Well, yeah, okay. We can reopen it. And the, the signal is not my, my issue. I, I dropped the signal because that was a voluntary thing on my part. I dropped it, but it may be a Placer County issue at Canal and Luther, which I heard their attorney bring up. It's not in my project, so he's behind the times. Uh, that's been dropped, and, um, you know, it may come up later, but that's not with me. So he can sue somebody else on that one. Thanks. Bye. Anything else, Rich? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Jim. Gary, this is going to bring it back to you. Uh, Carol Arvey has some questions that remain open. Uh, my teeth are starting to float. That's uh, probably TMI, right? Too much information. Uh, with all your permission, let's take just 10 minutes, and then we'll come back, Carol. We'll answer your questions, and then we'll have discussion on this and see if we can wrap it up.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I did have it on. Let's resume the, the meeting. At this point, public input is closed. The applicant has responded, and it's now back to staff to answer questions, make comments, and so forth. Uh, oh, Jerry, you got a point. Several questions that did come up uh, with regards to Mr. Keyes. He had several issues, which Mr. Conkey has uh, responded to. It's within the purview of the uh, Planning Commission if there's a desire to look for the preservation of the oak trees on site, and, and uh, Jerry Haas is prepared to respond to that. Regarding the limitations on delivery hours, that's within the purview of the Planning Commission, should you so desire uh, to limit them. And there was also a request for the use of graffiti-resistant paint and require cleanup within 48 hours. Uh, staff believe that's a reasonable condition, and if it's uh, agreeable to the uh, commission, we would uh, request that you add that condition uh, to the project. There was also an issue that was raised regarding the fair share discussion. Uh, the fair share discussion was twofold. Uh, one request was um, to discern who exactly is paying for the environmental review, particularly staff time, and I think the figure quota was about $400,000. Uh, the answer to that is the applicant is paying for all this. The applicant is being billed for all of staff time to review the project in addition to all the consultants' time, so that's uh, not, a sh not a cost that's being encumbered on the community. Uh, regarding the fair share, uh, I'll turn that over to our engineer uh, for the capital improvements. I'm just going to give you a brief explanation of how we pay for uh, traffic infra uh, infrastructure. Basically, when the community plan is identified, land use, um, we run a traffic uh, generation uh, land use model during the community plan. We identify that certain roads need certain infrastructure. Um, that infrastructure is built into a capital improvement program that Public Works maintains. Um, that program then dovetails into a traffic mitigation fee program. So for the improvements that were identified during the Auburn Bowman Community Plan adoption, um, there is a mechanism where we charge a developer ca um, traffic impact fees for those improvements. In areas where there are improvements that are outside of improvements that we identified during the adoption of the community plan, um, there is a fair share, and we talk about that in the conditions of approval, there's a fair share on the developer for the traffic that the project will generate over and above um, the, existing tra the difference between the existing traffic that's on the network and the cumulative traffic, so the ultimate community plan build-out traffic um, they have a portion, a fair share of that traffic. We equate that into dollars, and that is charged to the developer specifically at the time um, they pull permits. There was one question you had that was left dangling there. Could you hear that, Stephanie? Yeah, I did. We don't actually have that figure at this point. Um, that's something that we identify later on in the process. And finally, yeah, I, I don't even really have an approximate um, number at this point. And she also wants to know if there's any way to estimate the real cost uh, to the impact of air pollution. Uh, there are air pollution, uh, air mitigation. Mitigation fees for um, air quality impacts. I uh, can't speak to how those were arrived at, but we do have someone from Air Pollution Control District here uh, to, to illuminate that issue if you'd like. Okay. I don't think so. Um, Scott, did you want to address the issues raised by Mr. Finney? Yes, I, I would like to respond to Mr. Finney's letter. Um, we have had a, a very short time to take a look at a fairly substantial letter in a process that's gone over a number of years. It's unfortunate that it does come in this late because it does uh, make it difficult to respond to. Notwithstanding the fact that we've only had a short period of time, as soon as we did receive it, I have uh, had the opportunity to discuss this letter with uh, the environmental consultant and with the staff who are most familiar with the issues. Um, Mr. Moose suggested that uh, we could rectify any mistakes before the Board of Supervisors, which of course we would do, but I do feel it's my duty to tell you that at this point, 
uh, based upon the cursory review we've had and our ability to uh, review the letter, we do believe that the environmental document which is being presented to you here today to certify for this project is sufficient. We believe this letter may be based upon some factual misunderstandings which are perhaps based upon the fact uh, there was insufficient time to review all the documents before the letter was prepared. And uh, we do believe there are just some mistaken assumptions in there in terms of some of the conclusions in the document. Furthermore, as Mr. Moose uh, did point out, uh, there are some legal arguments that are made in here, which if this does result in litigation, uh, of course, would be subject of the judge. And uh, we do believe that based upon the totality of the document that there is substantial evidence supporting the findings which are presented uh, for certification of this document here today. One last comment I, I do need to uh, make in reviewing the letter, of course, with the threat of litigation. One reviews the indemnification obligation of the project, and uh, Condition 131 here does obliga obligate the uh, project proponent to defend and indemnify the county in the event there is litigation. Uh, to my chagrin, I notice that uh, uh, because we've been this, through this before, the condition is the condition which we utilized for another large project, Home Depot, and so it references Home Depot. So if you do uh, choose to approve this project, I would request that the words Home Depot in Condition 131 be replaced with the Bohemia Retail Project. But based upon that, uh, I, I am prepared to submit the document for your consideration here today. As Mr. Moose says, should there be an appeal, we will certainly review the letter in, in detail. And uh, as he indicates, I think the applicant has pledged if there is any shortcoming identified, that would be uh, reviewed and determined for further action before the Board of Supervisors. Okay, thank you, sir. Are there any questions of Scott? Jerry, do you have anything else to present? I have a general comment on these letters that come in, in the, at the last minute. We, none of us have had a chance to look at that either. So I hope that it will go to the board with comments. It seems to be a big ploy by attorneys to throw, throw a letter at the reviewing board at the very 12th hour uh, when the decision is supposed to be made. That's very unrealistic uh, for the you developers that might be here to throw that at us now. It, it should have been a week ago, and we could have probably read it. We're not like the federal government. We read things. <laughs> OK. Any other comments from the commission? Jerry, do you have anything else? I uh, just wanted to point out the trees that uh, David Keyes is referring to. You can actually see them aerially. They're right here. Um, they're two very large oak trees. actually. They go all the way back. That's them right there. Uh, they've been here for quite a long time. If there's some ability to incorporate them into project design during design review, we'd like to try that. Um, I don't know if you want to make a condition of approval to that effect, but that's something that we would certainly make an effort to do. Okay. Anything else? I have a couple things, uh, if I may. Uh, is there any way that we can limit the hours of business This is a discretionary approval um, before the Planning Commission, so if the Commission so desires, it is appropriate that, uh, and it is within your purview, to limit hours of operation. Yeah, I don't Are care whether it's uh, Walmart or Costco or whoever that goes in there, but I would like to see a condition in here that would limit the number of hours they can be open. It, in is that there project. some direction that you would provide? Uh, 6 a.m. to uh, midnight? That condition 5 does. Uh, That's in there, isn't it? Yes, it is. Condition 5 stipulates 6 a.m. to midnight. Yeah, they, then I would ask that that be reviewed after, say, a year. Is it too long for the neighborhood to put up with? But I'm saying let's, let's condition it to have another review in, in a year by staff. Would we bring this back before your commission for consideration in one year's time? Let's say in a year after or it, it, it's opened up. It would be. Staff looks at uh, the hours of business. Are they too long? Too short? Huh? Too short? 
No, no, not too short. And the commission has done this on other projects, and if it is the desire of the commission, it, it would be appropriate to have this item brought back before your commission for review and consideration in a year's time. Okay, then you can bring them back. I, I won't be here then anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there's nothing else from the One more thing, please. Yeah. Uh, the PG&E site, that is an industrial site. We don't know how long it's going to be there, a year, 10 years, or longer. When that changes from industrial to something else, that needs to be brought back here, right? I'm, I'm concerned that, the, that they throw some other big industrial type project in there that will just complicate uh, the whole project. But let's have it all zoned much the same. Does that make sense? Um, I can't speak historically. The, the property was zoned MP. There was some confusion about this earlier. MP is a do zoning designation that no longer exists. It, what, what it means now is industrial park. Back then, MP was industrial park. Today, it's INP, which is industrial park. They're the same thing. Both of them would allow for moderate industrial uses as well as most commercial uses. So the commercial use of the site has been identified for decades now. Only recently, well, not recently, but in 1994 when the community plan was adopted, the underlying land use designation changed to commercial and the zoning correspondingly changed to commercial plan development. A lot of times when PG&E vacates a, si a site, Jerry. what happens to those sites? It comes back for rezoning, correct? It, that is something that we could look at. This is really outside the purview of this specific project. I understand What I would that. recommend is that staff bring back a report to you to consider options that would be available to the commission and to the Board of Supervisors uh, should that pg e Corporation yard uh, cease operation on that okay, site. Okay, okay. And then finally, I was looking through the uh, documents of uh, uh, rodent barriers. Last month, we had quite a discussion on rodent barriers, and I didn't see anything in here about it. And, and that generally is a standard condition of approval, and, and if it's not in there, uh, I would recommend that the Planning Commission add the requirement for uh, the rodent barriers on the per perimeter of the site that would be put in place prior to any uh, grading operations on the property. Okay, thank you. Let me see, on the oak tree being considered in the design review uh, process, I say yes. The graffiti resistant paint, I say yes. You know, I guess my uh, teacher didn't teach me right, but when I saw 6 a.m. to 12 a.m., I thought that was an error because I usually think of midnight as 12 p.m., but at any rate, no, it probably would be better to say uh, uh, 6 to uh, midnight or something like that. But at any rate, on the delivery part of it, now I notice that both the deliveries and the uh, open hours are the same. And, uh, you know, I would probably be willing to go with, for deliveries, uh, knocking those off by at 10 o'clock or something like that in the evening so people aren't hearing uh, the trucks come rolling in when they're trying to go to sleep. Let me see, I have uh, a few other questions, too, that uh, I guess I'm assuming that... Uh, <coughs> On the Wise Canal, there's uh, a, a FERC boundary, and I'm assuming it looks like on the map that that FERC boundary is a property line for this project. That's that correct. Wise okay. Canal forms the property line. So then, other than the uh, reconstruction of the bridge over the canal, uh, there will be no impact within that FERC boundary. Uh, that project is going. That's a separate project. The, the expansion and the reconstruction of the canal that's going through a FERC process at this time. Okay, but this project won't affect the canal other than the bridge going over the canal, right? <coughs> I'm not sure if any sewer improvements would be going over the canal or not. I'll turn that over to... The bridge, it appeared to me that the bridge is going to be reconstructed. That the bridge will be reconstructed as a separate project. Um, whether or not there are other improvements, water lines or sewer lines, I'm not sure. Also, the access to, to this project uh, is going to use the existing bridge? It's going to replace the existing bridge. There's okay. a bridge out there. It's going to be, uh, uh, I guess, increased. It's going, to, it's going to be able to hold a fire truck uh, and the traffic that's going to go into the property. Okay, and so that'll be the only, uh, only impact that uh, this project is going to cause on the FERC 
That's uh, what we anticipate, correct. Yeah. I think, in fact, if there are any lines that go across their sewer or water, they would go near where the bridge is. Uh, yeah, near where the bridge is and towards the railroad tracks, there are some easements either already obtained or being obtained to go underground. And I'm not sure if that really falls under the purview of FERC. I'm not an expert on FERC. The, the sewer line is not going across the bridge. Oh. No, no, not across the bridge, but in that area of the yeah, property. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't cross, it doesn't cross that. Okay. Okay. That, that kind of brings up maybe the next area that, uh, and this is really just for understanding. I was a little bit confused. Uh, apparently the sewer is going to uh, feed into a reconstructed sewer line that's somewhere around the new airport road, and so it would be quite a project associated with that. It sounded a, a little bit confusing in terms of stormwater, you know, when we're, going to have, you know, upwards to 18 acres of roof <coughs> and pavement. There's going to be quite a bit of water. It looks to me like uh, there's going to be an underground storage for the storm water. And then, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to understand how the storm water is going to be treated and, and uh, you know, eventually, you know, it gets cleaned up through different uh, things, but how's it going to get off the property? Yeah, my name is Ron Clint with Doucette. Uh, SGI civil engineers. Uh, I've been working on this project since 1989, 88, something like that. Is it on? Pump it. Uh, it's on. Just put it closer to your mouth. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. I've been working on this project since uh, 88, I think. Um, the drainage system is such that there's detention that's uh, required for this project, so we have to detain to pre-project runoff conditions. Uh, there's two possible potential detention configurations. One is building a detention pond uh, above ground in that landscape area in the north corner, northwest corner. Um, that's one potential which would take out some of the parking. Uh, have uh, calculations shown, we have calculations that have shown that there's approximately one acre foot to one and a half acre foot, foot of a detention that's required before it goes into a storm drain system that collects the drainage from the property and comes down in a storm drain uh, that it goes across Wise Canal just south of the bridge and then comes down and connects to a storm drain that was built under Highway 49 back in, uh, gosh, I think it was built in 1989 um, the Auburn Plaza connects to that and there's capacity in that. It was designed to handle this project back then. Uh, that's one detention uh, possibility. The other detention possibility is the one that's shown now. That's an underground gallery of enlarged pipes. Uh, again, that will show one acre foot of detention more or less, depending on what the final calculations come out. Uh, a restriction in the flows. Uh, to assure that there's the runoff coming off of the property um, to pre-project conditions. Uh, the project is required to provide all of the drainage studies. We've provided some preliminary drainage studies um, to the county uh, that's included in the EIR. In addition to that, the previous project, uh, which was going through design, which was, uh, or at least we were doing, working on the design, which was the residential project, had similar type runoffs. Uh, they were a little bit less, and there was a detention basin designed for that. So the calculations are, are fairly close in the magnitude of what the, the detention requirements are, and uh, the site plan has been designed to handle those detention requirements. And so, uh, so I guess by detention you mean you're going to slow the drainage of yeah. water off the site? Yes, basically the way storm water works and hydrology works, um, depending on what the characteristics of the site are, the uh, pervious areas, impervious areas, there's a calculation that shows what runoff will come in a 10-year, 25-year storm, et cetera. Um, so we do the calculations based on the existing ground as it is now and then do the calculations based on the storm drain system and the project. 
uh, and what we have to do is make those calculations for the proposed storm drain system match uh, what's going off the site now. One of the ways to do that is to detain the water on site. So basically your, your storm has peaks, it rises, uh, hydrograph and then drops down so there's a peak in the storm and what you try to do is flatten out the peak and take the storage underneath the peak and put that into some sort of a, a detention facility. Okay. Uh, you said 25 year or, you, you know, a lot of times they look at a 100 year storm as being the... Typically not for detention. Uh, 25 year storm, if I um, know the county's requirements is what you detain to. A um, 100 year storm, you want to make sure that the site is protected for a 100 year storm. But uh, one of the things that you have to understand that the difference between a 25 year storm and a 100 year storm is not four times the amount of runoff. It's only about, I think it's like 15% more or something like that. So there's a marginal difference between a, uh, there's a big difference between a 10 and a 25 and then not so much between a 25 and 100. Okay, so, so at any rate, I guess what I'm hearing then is uh, in the subsequent and you'll be developing this system subsequent to our decision to there's, do There's been a, a fair amount of work done on it to this point because what we have to do when we're doing this portion of the project, make sure that we have um, a system that can be built and will meet the county requirements. We wouldn't want to get a project approved and then go, oh, well, we can't make it work. Mm -hmm. So we have to be confident enough in our calculations that we can make the project work. Um, that shaded area, uh, that's actually as a result of figuring out how many large pipes can be put in, where they can be put in to meet the requirements, the preliminary requirements that we've done for detention on the site. Okay, and those would be underneath the parking lot. Those, those would be underneath the parking lot. That's, uh, it, it could be that the parking lot, again, is shrunk, and then there's uh, more of a landscape area with a depression, which is your typical detention pond. Okay, and then the storm drain that's going to go across the canal, that doesn't storm. exist yet or it does? The storm drain does not exist. It goes along uh, across the canal. It exists up to basically the end of Auburn Plaza. There's a, a stub okay. of a pipe at that point. Uh, the next has been built with Auburn Plaza coming down the hill, and it goes across the um, Highway 49, connects into the storm drain through the um, car lots, and then out to a ravine. Okay, and then I, I'm also assuming that the county has some standard calculations for uh, design of quantities that they'll meet? They, they have hydrology calculations, uh, requirements that we have to meet in our report. They will review our report with our improvement plans. Okay. How about quality treatment as well as quantity? Pardon? There's a variety of methods, um, and as this project progresses, the state's mandated additional things for low-impact development that have to be done, which I'm sure this, by the time we get into design in this project, those will have to be met. Um, what we do is we use vegetative swales, so you drain uh, areas of the parking lot to vegetative areas, and then use the vegetation to clean the, the project. Uh, the project runoff. Um, there's other methods. There's actual, um, you know, um, vaults and boxes and, and so on and so forth with filtering type uh, items in them. Proprietary is the word I was trying to think of. Proprietary structures that you can buy that will filter certain amounts of storm drain runoff. Uh, this, if there is an above ground detention area, a large amount of this area would probably be taken to that and that detention area would then be also used uh, for water quality. So there's a variety of the, the area on the south end, that some of that area down there that you see in landscaping, there's some small uh, detention areas in that area that are used for water quality as well. So a variety of things are used along the um, Wise Canal boundary. There's uh, some of the area of the uh, westerly portion of the the parking lots intended to go down there and be filtered in the landscape areas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see one. Uh, I have a few more here. Oh, Still going. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I noticed that at the uh, gas station, there's a requirement that uh, that curbing be put around the gas station so that it, it contain 100 gallons of gasoline. That's in the event of a surface uh, spill, 
that it would be captured by the curb and treated before it's uh, released into, I don't know if it goes in the storm drain or if it's just captured and retained on site. Um, there are additional protection measures for the, the tank itself. Underground, it's double walled with uh, alarms that indicate if there's some kind of a breach of either of the walls. Uh, but for the surface spills, 100 gallons was anticipated to be you know, more or less the maximum you could expect from uh, a facility that size and, and the height of the curb walls and the detention system and treatment system on site is determined to be adequate. Uh, adequate. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like it's a pretty standard requirement. From right, the there are a number of conditions in here that are specifically for the gas station, both from engineering and surveying and environmental health having to do with the hazards of the spill. I guess the only thing that maybe it, it was a question in my mind, and I don't know how significant it is, is, uh, you know, you have delivery trucks that have, you know, a few thousand gallons. If there's a malfunction in the delivery truck, then how is, how do we deal with that? You know, well, I deal is, mostly uh, with the grading of it, um, keeping a canopy over it to keep rain from spreading it further, dealing with grading it back towards areas so that it, can't just uh, flow off site. Is anyone from environmental health here that wants to speak? Because that 100 gallon is actually their requirement. I would imagine um, that these trucks have a lot of safety measures built into them for these aspects. Um, perhaps the applicant team knows where that comes from. I can speak to the gas station. I've owned gas stations for years, including the Arco at Dry Creek and Highway 49, the Chevron at Comby Road and Highway 49, and one in Roosevelt. <clears throat> So a lot of the uh, safety issues are redundant. There's so many, and the trucks have them. Um, the, the curb is uh, above and beyond anything I've ever done before, and these are all new stations. I built them, and we operate them ourselves. Um, <clears throat> so you have a lot of backup that you have to do and meet state standards. The state kind of controls a lot of that. And then there's local standards that Placer County has. Um, the ones that are on and the trucks have backup and shut off. I've never, I, the most we've ever had where the hose, the guy rips the hose out of the, the dispenser is maybe that came to like 10 gallons and it, it, it shuts off. Mm -hmm. And so you, then you have environmental stuff that you put on there that you buy and it soaks it off. And that would be contained within your curbing? That's, I mean, the curbing will go around where the delivery point is. Well, I, I didn't have any curbing on any of the other stations. We're, we're doing this one as a, we're adding curbing on this one just to back it up even more. Okay. So it keeps it within the property of the of the fuel fueling station, so it can't get out. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Let me see again. That, oh. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, probably. I, I have another question for environmental health, but they're not here. Maybe. Or, but at any rate. Uh, in the road thing, uh, at least what I'm hearing and understanding is that the uh, Canal Street stoplight is a, is a county issue, and the proponent is going to be paying into uh, a, a fee that ultimately, if that's decided to be built by the county, that he will have helped build it at that time, but it's not related to his project. It, Correct. The, okay. the, the Auburn Bowman Community Plan, um, when it was developed, we identified the need, a future need, for a signal at Luther and Canal. Um, it's not triggered with this project. However, they are paying traffic mitigation fees, and that is one of the items that's in the capital improvement program for Auburn. So yes, they will be paying a portion towards that, okay. uh, towards that signal. Okay, thank you. And then also there was some discussion of um, some changes that are going to happen on New Airport Road and Bell Road, and apparently those aren't in that Auburn Bowman plan, and so that will be part of this project. Um, those are actually a, an impact that was identified as part of an existing plus project scenario. Um, and so therefore under CEQA, there's a build obligation for mitigation. So they are building it with the, with the construction of the project. Okay. And when I read it, I tried to understand it, but I didn't understand it very well. Maybe you could explain what those improvements will be at that location. Um, the improvements are basically a, a separated northbound um, right turn lane at that project, correct? Yeah. Separated northbound right turn lane. For access to Bell Road. For access from New Airport to, um, to Bell Road, correct. Okay, and currently it's either straight ahead or a, a right turn, so it would be a separate lane actually. It's going to be Currently, yes. Yeah. So, so the configuration that you would have ultimately after the improvements are done is you'd have a separated left, a separate through, and a separate right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess, uh, 
other than the changes that I already indicated that I would go with, uh, one of the issues that I think came up in the attorney's letter, and, and I was kind of listening to several people talk about asbestos, and uh, I've always associated asbestos with serpentine soils, but in the document itself, I didn't see a reference to uh, serpentine soils on this site. Though I know there are some serpentine soils out there, so at least I'm assuming that this site isn't made up with serpentine type soils, or I don't know if that's something that really needs to be pursued or not. That would be a question, I guess. I this is an area of, of naturally occurring asbestos. Um, I don't know that we've identified any on the property that will be discovered upon uh, initiation of construction. There are mitigation measures to prevent um, fugitive dust, particularly um, NOA if it's found on the site, and that those are standard best management practices that are implemented with, with any commercial development in, this, in the foothills here. Okay, you say NOA, maybe? Naturally occurring asbestos, so if there is asbestos, it has the potential to, be, to be, uh, um, air, become airborne. It'll be uh, mitigated through the best management practices during construction. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hi, Larry Needle, and I submitted a map of the natural occurring yeah, asbestos right. with my yeah. packet. Thank you. And it's, uh, we're in the highest level of NOA in this region. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else, uh, Rich? Any other questions of staff by anybody yes. on the commission? Mr. Chairman, I do have one suggestion. Um, Mr. Richardson suggesting uh, adopting a condition for the, uh, the sound wall and some kind of a surfacing. Um, it was mentioned that paint might be considered. I do have a condition. It's, uh, a request from uh, Mr. David Keyes that the sound wall along Canal Street shall be constructed or surfaced with a graffiti resistant material. In other words, paint uh, doesn't work as well as some kind of material that could be laid over the surface there. What is graffiti resistant material? It's new to me. Now, I don't have the slightest it's idea. I, like a block sealer? That a, makes a, it a sealer? I, 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 can, I can address that because I actually use it. It's almost like a clear wax that you just spray over and so when they come and spray spray paint and stuff then you can just take a power washer and it washes it off. Wow. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Terry. And then back to the commission for discussion. Just on a note with the graffiti issue, um, me, whether or not they put a coating on that makes it easy to come off isn't so much as important as that it actually comes off in a time period. I, I think that's probably more important to say that, it, that the graffiti is removed within 48 hours or something like that. And if they don't want to coat it to make it easy on themselves, that's a, a business decision. I, I, I do have a question of staff. Is there a ordinance or anything in the county that um, addresses that because I know in a lot of the cities that they have ordinances that you've got to, uh, any business has to take care of any graffiti within a certain length of time. At, at this point in time there is not a specific requirement within the county however because this is a discretionary approval it is within the purview of the commission to add such a condition should you so desire. Okay, well, then let's bring it back and we need to discuss the concept. What I would suggest for our consideration is to split the consideration of the certification of the final EIR away from the other conditions since we apparently want to discuss those in greater details. Uh, we've had advice with respect to the uh, uh, FEIR and whether we can proceed with it. Um, so anybody want to discuss the EIR itself? or make the motion that be approved or denied? Or? Well, at this point, I'd go ahead and uh, make the motion that we uh, go ahead and certify the final environmental impact report. For, Mr. Chair, if I may, if I could uh, refer you to page 18 of the staff report, and finding 1A would be the finding to certify the EIR for the CUP. You'll see there's actually findings for the CUP and findings for the minor use permit. So I think okay, I would add the findings for approval of minor use, uh, I mean the the findings for approval of the e final, in, in other words, 1A on the Yeah, 1A. Yeah. The final 
certify the final environmental impact statement report for the Bohemia retail project and adopt the statement of findings and statement of overriding considerations as attached in attachment A and approve the mitigating monitoring plan as included in the fire, final environmental impact report, as well as uh, find and approve the uh, offsite sign as. Well, we're, we're, we're not going to offsite sign yet. No. We're just looking at the final EIR. Yeah, 1A is just the certifying the final EIR for the conditional use permit. That's all we're doing now is moving that off that, the table. That includes attachment A, which is the, the findings. Yeah, and the overriding considerations. Okay. That's the motion. Was there a second? Second. Second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Opposed. Oh, okay. Let's roll call it, Kathy. Mr. Schneider. Yes. 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 So the motion carries. Now we come down to the project itself and the conditions and so forth that we've been discussing. We've had a lot of testimony here from the neighbors about uh, conditions. We've had testimony from those who are in favor of it. Uh, any comments or discussion? Well, the comment I would like to make is the the approval today is not for a Costco, a Walmart, or any other of those big box stores. It's only to move forward with the zoning that's there. That, that's all we're asked to do, right? No zoning today. We're not changing well, zoning. No, okay. Project. And that's typical. But I'd like the neighbors to know for sure that. We're not voting on whether it's a Walmart or a Costco or Pets or whatever. No, and we don't do that as a rule. No, when we, we approve don't. a shopping center, it's just tenant spaces. We don't know who's going in. Yeah, I think the key here is we're not doing Is your microphone on? Plan. Excuse me. We're not doing zoning. That's a good idea. I don't know. Just turned it off again. They turned it off again? Oh, no, they, they took care of you in the back. There, I'm on now. Okay. I think it's critical to have everyone realize that we're not rezoning and we're not doing a general plan. That's been done a long time ago. We're now approving a use that's consistent with all that. And so what we're saying is we're directing that this is okay or it isn't okay to do it in a certain fashion. There's been a lot of people that have suggested that maybe it should be a, a combination of buildings and different things. That certainly would affect the, the uh, aesthetics of the, of the project, but I'm not sure that that's the key issue here. I think a lot of people think that that might create a single use, but if you had a building for every use that potentially could go in this large structure, you'd have a lot of buildings. And I'm not sure that that would be as efficient and as well done as it could be under one, one roof and one, one owner and one manager. I mean, when you get to do graffiti removal, is it was the guy shopping at my store or over at his store? So it gets to be confusing this way. It's a sure thing. In the comment, I'm not. That's, that's well, I understand not. what you're saying, yeah. Larry. Uh, <clears throat> if I was being asked to approve a Walmart. To they, I'd say definitely no. That's not the issue. Right, right. We also have the issue of the impact on the neighbors. And there's no question that, that it will have some impact. <coughs> but golly, you know, the time to really get into that is when the community plan is adopted, not after the fact and at the 11th hour. And it makes it really tough for us to have to weigh the interests of the neighbors and the EIR and the interests of the property owner because he has rights too. And it's been zoned this way for forever. I remember when Bohemia was there and the log trucks would back up on 49 and you couldn't get through because of them stopping there. Mm -hmm. And it, it was tough. Um, I, I'm really loath to, to stop a project because of some impact. And it's difficult for me to understand how you can hear the impact of this thing over the railroad. Which is, which is there as well. That's not being flipped, it's just a fact of life. 49 and the railroad make a lot of noise. 
I don't have an easy answer to it, but when I balance these things, I come down in favor of the property rights. I think there was also that thing that staff brought up. They wanted to change the condition 131, change Home Depot to Bohemian to, as a minor correction. Well, we have some tweaking to do if we're going to approve the project. So uh, I'm not sure well, where we should go in this. Okay, well, one, one thing, I, and we've always done it in the past, is, is we've potentially added some conditions here, and I'd just like to give the applicant, Mr. Conkey, a chance to address if, hey, I don't have any problems with it, or I have problems with, you know, know, with some of it. Well, then let's discuss these well, That might change the vote, too. You never know. There was the condition that Scott referenced, 131, changing the name Home Depot to Bohemia. I know that Mr. Conkey will not <laughs> disagree with that. Oak tree. There is the issue of the oak tree. Should we make that a condition, or should we leave that up to the Design Review Committee? Because I know they try to minimize the impact on the trees, but you know they do have a lot of experience in that area. Well, I think, from my perspective, if they can design around them practically, do it. If they absolutely just can't do it, well, that's the way it is, but that's staff's job then. And that's what the condition is. Yeah. 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 I think that's that what the condition really was proposed to say. And <clears throat> I think if we include that uh, condition in here, it still leaves flexibility, but at least adds importance to uh, looking at that oak tree to see if it can be saved. Sure. How would the condition read? It's a sense of the Planning Commission that the Design Review Committee tried to save as many trees as possible? or. Well, I think we're just talking about the one tree. The rest of the trees, in essence, are along the uh, uh, Fiddler Green Canal, which is going to be relo undergrounded. So, so I don't know. Maybe there's a suggestion on how we might word that. Do you have a suggestion for the wording? Uh, we could word it something to the effect of, to the extent feasible, the applicant shall attempt to preserve one or two of the oak trees that are out there in the uh, southeast corner, uh, southeast portion of the project site. It may involve um, the realignment of the, of the driveway. It may actually be far enough back where it impacts the, the shape of the building uh, as it's proposed. So one, and, and that's where the loading dock is, so that's why I think it's, it, it may, be, may be difficult. Um, but if we have the wording limiting it to, to the extent feasible, then it gives us some ability to negotiate. I wouldn't want it to be mandatory. I just want it to be a level of importance if, that, if, if you can. Before we get to that point, shouldn't an uh, arborist review those trees too? See if they're worth saving? Uh, those trees right. were right. reviewed in the arborist report that is included in the EIR. Um, I don't know, I, I don't recall exactly what it says about the relative health of those trees, but they, they sure appear to be pretty vibrant. Yeah. We, we would, staff exactly. would check the, the health of those trees to determine that they were worthy of preservation. And then, as previously noted through the design review committee, uh, staff would work with the applicant to see if the, the site design can be modified to allow for the preservation of those trees. And there's no guarantee that those oak trees are going to stand there forever. They don't. They come down sooner or later by their own or by someone else's making. Okay, and uh, Harry, you had an issue with the hours, the operating hours. I thought I was already in there. It, it is. Did you want to modify them at all? No, leave it the way it is. Okay. Okay, I wanted the to. The modification that we made. I wanted to modify the uh, delivery times. Okay, and your proposal is? From uh, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Okay, may, Mr. Conkey. Can I speak to that? Sure. Um, this is really a sensitive issue. Uh, they schedule these trucks and, and the deliveries. So it's, it becomes, it's a really serious issue with any potential tenant. What I'd like to do is, is 10, it, like people can live with the 6 to 11, but 6 to 10 is like a killer. And then I, you know, I'd have to go back to the board and try to chant. Just tell you, it's, it's really key to the project and, and attracting a tenant. So that's, okay. that's my concern. I, I can back it off an hour. I've done many of these projects over the 30 years, and that's something that's really difficult to work with on that. So I just want you to know that. And on, on the tree, that is the problem is the, um, the reason we couldn't save it was because that's where the second access was. 
now it's just for emergency and it's also the um, dock is there and it, it may not be, be right I, I so we looked at I mean if we could save that those oak trees I've always tried to do that but we are you know as, as Planning Commissioner Crab said these things do die and they go they don't live forever these aren't those types of trees they they live but these happen to be beautiful and they're big there's no doubt about it and if there's a way we'll work with staff to do it but I I simply can't commit to it it just happened to be it's difficult to deal with could you could you commit to the wording that we came up with where you do have yeah I, I think that's fair in the design review and it's, we work with staff and it's not mandatory um, go ahead. Yeah. Relocation of Fiddler Green Canal will go right under the roots. Under, under the what? The relocation of Fiddler, Gr Fiddler Green Canal will go right under the roots. Are those particular trees? Yes, those particular trees. Yeah, that was, uh, basically, that was the other the issue. You the back of the, we have the room between the back of the building and basically where the wall is to fit Fiddler Green Canal, and it's got to be in a landscape area because of grades. Um, and that's right where that's in a direct line with those oak trees. That's probably the primary reason why they can't be saved, because we have the requirement to underground Fiddler Green Canal, and that's pretty much the only place that that can go. Well, at least in, in my view, we're just asking you to take another look at the feasibility as an important issue. That, that that's fine. You never I mean, know. I mean, that that's fine. We're we're happy to try and work that. Okay. And, Okay. Oh, Jim, uh, the the other one was the graffiti yeah. and Yeah, we're, we're okay with that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And the 48 hours? Well, that's I've I've been I've owned a lot of shopping centers and uh you uh, 48 hours you got to run around like a crazy guy. You, yeah. you would know that, Mr. Denial. Uh I'd like at least 72. That's 3 days. Um with that I I think that's fair. But it's tough to get those replaced. And remember, there'll be a lot of landscaping. It'll be difficult to see, but we don't want graffiti on anything, and we, we even if this wasn't a requirement, that's something we would do anyway. We would put that material on, because we've learned a lot of lessons about that. It's way easier and cheaper to put that material on and not have to try to, once you know somebody's put graffiti on, try to repaint it or get it off there. So that, that's not a problem with us. Just, just give us a little more time. I think, I think three days is fair. Okay. Thank you. And so that is really, oh, rodent barriers. And they had us, the staff had a suggested wording for that. I do have a suggested wording for the, um, uh, for the oak trees. Uh, to the extent feasible, the applicant shall attempt to preserve the two large oak trees that stand alone in the southeast portion of the site. Okay. Does anybody want to, let's, we, let's take them one at a time. Anybody want to make a motion to adopt that? As I make the motion. The wording? Second. The second? Any discussion? The motion is to adopt that wording of the oak trees. That we wish you would do something. That if feasible to, to save them. That's the motion. It's been seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay, so that's going to be incorporated in the final thing. Now the hours. Let me see. I, I would make the motion for a number. I guess it's number 17, condition number 17, that we uh, change the hours of delivery from uh, six, 2, 6 to 11 p.m. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <clears throat> I have some discussion. I want, you know, we typically have allowed it till midnight in, in commercial establishments. I don't know why we want to vary this one by one hour. Um, I want to encourage economic development and economic success, not limit it. So I would go with the original uh, hours in the staff report. I think the advantage to that is it gets your the ability to have your deliveries come in and off peak traffic hours. Yeah. You know, when your customer base isn't in there and everything else. Yeah, and if they close at 10 p.m., well, you got an hour. Well, that's real thin pickings in my mind. I, I just offer that up in deference to the residents. Okay, well, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Let's uh, let's roll call that. Okay. Okay. No. Yes. Mr. Moss? No. Mr. Gray? Yes. Mr. Crabb? No. Mr. Johnson? Yes. 
No. So we have four to three. Motion fails. Four. Motion fails. Okay, graffiti. Well, we ought to have them. Well, it's, we'll just, it's going to stay the way it is then. Yeah. Okay. There's no changing. Um, <clears throat> the wording was to require them to use anti-graffiti material and to remove graffiti within some period of time after discovery, I assume is what the time period is. He requested three days. <coughs> you had been talking 48 hours. Do you have a motion or specifics? I, uh, I would move that um, three days is reasonable. Second. So, so your, your motion is that three days is reasonable, are you? <laughs> for, 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 well, for it's notification smooth. and yeah. cleaning the graffiti off the walls. And to use the anti-graffiti material? And use the graffiti Okay. Material. Does that make any sense? It does. We, we, we have, have captured that. Okay. That's the case. And there's a motion. Was it seconded? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay, that's click, click, click. We haven't done the condition 131 yet on Home Depot versus Bohemia. Yeah. You want to make so a move? It's sort of a gift. I, mean, I know. We'll make okay. it formal here. Okay, all those in favor of that say aye. 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 Opposed, none. And Mr. Chair, there was also a comment from the Commission, uh, a possible desire to bring the hours of operation back for review by the Commission within a year's time after the opening of the facility. There was some discussion. I don't well, know. Well, I thought that way, the way we were leaning is to do that, bring it back. But maybe the, the commission wants to do something else. Make motion, then. Well, I'll make the motion that we stick to that. Stick bring to it what? back after a year for review. I'll second that. So, All right. You know what it is? <laughs> the hours of operation? Yeah, I believe that your motion is that after one year, or after what, opening, that the hours of operation be reviewed by the Planning Commission. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, well, I just, uh, I'm, I'm going to vote against it because I think uh, it adds a level of complexity to uh, staff and the Planning Commission of the U.S. So. I yeah. think it also adds a, a, an uncertainty to whoever wants to make the investment of going in there that, hey, today you have these approvals, but 12 months from now you could be, you know, closing at noon at the whim of the, uh, the, the new Planning Commission. Or well, what I, why I did that was to, quite frankly, appease the neighbors to uh, help them move the project along. We have too much opposition to these projects like this. Are there any limitations on the operating hours in the Auburn Plaza next door? I don't know. I don't know either. I, you know, many of the things that we do in this county are complaint driven, and I would leave this one in that category, that if there's something that's causing a nuisance, that it should be driven by complaint rather than having to be automatically revisited by the commission. Uh, I would agree with that. It's a conditional use permit. and. The uncertainty, if the out, you're exactly right, no one will agree to that. I'd have to appeal it to the board because the uncertainty in a year is all of a sudden you're closing at 12 noon. I, there isn't anybody that's going to step up for that. So, uh, you know, if I had this on a project at Dry Creek when we had the motorcycle shop in there and we left it as a complaint driven issue and they can yank your conditional use permit. You know, if, but that was a motorcycle shop. This is, this is important to the operation of the stores. And um, th these tenants are sensitive to what's going on. I mean, if they get complaints from people, they, they respond. They want to be a part of the community. Um, but the uncertainty of that, it's the same as changing the time. I, I, it's just unacceptable. That's enough, Dave. I'll, Thanks. I'll remove that request. You're withdrawing but that. I'm also sensitive to the neighbors. Okay, you're withdrawing the motion? Yes. And the second withdrawals or second, whoever did it? I'll assume so. Okay, if that's the case, then I think that completes my list of tweaks, except the rodent barriers. We didn't discuss that. And as the Commission is aware, this issue has come up on other projects. The staff does have a standard condition that requires uh, wire fencing be 
uh, placed around the perimeter of the site prior to any on-site grading uh, to minimize and eliminate the uh, potential for rodents to uh, go onto adjoining properties. How often? And if it's a desire of the commission, we could include that condition. How often do you use that condition, even though it's a standard one? Uh, d typically, with any project that has on-site grading. Okay. Well then, what? How does the condition read, or is, don't you have it in front of you? Uh, the condition reads that rodent barrier fencing shall be uh, constructed around the perimeter of the site uh, prior to any on-site grading subject to the review and approval of staff. You know, the only reason I ask for that condition is you have it in some of your other projects. Personally, I don't like it. And I'd like to come back to the Planning Commission at a later date to really discuss it. But it's something you people do. So let's be consistent with what we do why was until it, we remove that. Now why was it included here already? I, was, I cannot speak to that. I'll have to look and meet in, with staff and discuss that issue. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we don't want those mice running out on the railroad tracks. Uh, <laughs> I may be a little naive, but can somebody uh, describe what a rodent barrier is? I was thinking road barrier, but it's a it rodent is, barrier. It's, Typically, uh, wire mesh fencing, you have openings of approximately one quarter to three quarters of an inch, and you put it 12 inches into the ground and about 12 inches above, and it, it prohibits and limits the ability of rodents to leave the site and go onto adjoining property. They have to jump it. They get squished by the equipment. <laughs> okay, does anybody want to make a motion to include that? Yeah, I will. Does anybody want to second it? I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Aye. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Kathy, please. <laughs> no. Mr. Severson? No. Mr. Mott? Yes. Yes. Mr. Johnson? I'm going to change to no. Uh, Mr. Brentwell? No. So that fails. All right. That completes the tweaks. Now we're down to the big enchilada. And that is? Okay. Well, I would uh, make the motion that we approve the condition use permit as uh, we, uh, with the changes that we just made incorporated. And, uh, Adopt the uh, findings uh, for approval of the condition use permit as well as the uh, minor use permit and the uh, conditions as represented in uh, attachment D, I believe it is. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I might, I think what we're talking about is actually the findings for the conditional use permit as set forth on page 18 of the staff report, and that would be 1B for the conditional use permit then I'd ask you to take up the minor use permit later. Okay. So it's so conditions I'll do 1B then. Correct. 1B with the conditions of approval as modified through the motions of this uh, body. That's my motion. Okay. And your motion does not include the minor use permit at this point? No. I would ask you to take that up separately as a separate motion. All right. Very good. So we have a motion then and a second. 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 Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Kathy? Yes. Mr. Severson? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Gray? No. Mr. Crabb? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Uh, Mr. Brennan? Yes. So the motion carries six to one. Now we have the matter of the minor use permit to allow for an off-site sign along 49. Um, our staff report recommends that uh, we approve it based upon the findings and subject to the conditions of approval included in our staff report. Does anybody want to make a motion to, to do that? I'll make a motion that we approve the staff recommendation. We have a motion. Second. There's a second. And just for the record, Mr. Chairman, that would be the findings under 2A and B on page 18 and 19 of the staff report, Good which enough. includes conditions number one through uh, seven, I believe they are, on attachment Public Attachment E. Okay. Any discussion of that matter? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 
Kathy? Mr. Denayo? Yes. Mr. Severson? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Gray? No. Mr. Crabb? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Brenton? Yes. Okay, that motion carries six to one. Is there anything else that we need to do before we adjourn? Guess not. Appeal. Oh, appeal. oh. Appeal rights. Yep. Appeal rights. Um, anybody who wants to appeal this decision has 10 calendar days to do so. You file your appeal at the planning department, and there's a fee of $495 required for the appeal. The fee has changed. Oh, the fee has changed. What is it now? It's not any less. <laughs> Okay, it's in excess of $500. Um, 10 calendar days is the key. There being nothing else, we are for the